Hey everybody, it's Josh Rutledge, your co-host for Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support us more, please head over to our website, fearscapepodcast.com. There you can click on store and browse some really awesome t-shirts and maybe pick a couple up. Or even go to our Patreon page and see how you can support us monthly. We love bringing you awesome content just as much as you like listening to it. Enjoy the show. Hello. I'm so glad you could join us. I hope you brought your blanket to hide under. The spooky crew is going to discuss things and events from other realms. Ghosts. Cryptids. Aliens. Be sure to hold your blanket extra tight as the boys take you deep into the fear scale, fear scale, fear scale. (laughs) Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another frightening edition of Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. I am your host, Stefan Gearhart, and I am joined, as usual, by my reluctantly uh, selfish you're reluctantly selfish, oh, friend, <laughs> uh, Josh Rutledge. Welcome. That, that implies that I'm still selfish. I'm just reluctant about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You hate to be selfish. I hate to be selfish, you, but, you, I, but I still do it. You still do it. <laughs> Boy, you're just reluctant to do it. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's what happens when we improvise. Uh, so, yeah, we have a very interesting week of uh, catching up to do. We were both on vacation last week. Uh, boy, was it needed. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I needed it big time. I got to meet my sister, which was very cool. Through a DNA test, I found out uh, within the last few months that I have an older sister. So that was kind of neat. Yep. That was, re- was really cool. That A, that you found that out. Uh, B, that you reached out and, and see that like y'all connected. Oh, so. dude. I mean, she is a carbon cutout of me, but female. And we get along so well. And her kids are amazing. I'm sorry for her then. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was it was so much fun, and you know, you got some beach time. I got some Michigan beach time yeah. uh, at a little yeah, pond. Watch out for hypodermic needles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what we're going to be doing this week is something different than usual. We're not going to be um, researching and talking about a paranormal topic uh, in that regards that we normally do, but we're going to be researching and talking about our journey together so far. Yeah, and and when we say our journey, it's not necessarily our journey in doing this show. It's the kind of parallel journey that started right around the same time that I, I joined the show, but yeah. it's, but it's more of a, a almost spiritual in nature, um, along with, you know, that, that came along with doing the show. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you watched the show supernatural, it's at this point, it would say the story so far and then carry on my way. You would say, And then you would see this montage of everything that happened over the last 15 seasons, uh, except for we're just going to do the show on the montage. So we'll get to that in a little bit, but we're going to talk to you guys about where we've been, the thing you, you've heard us talk about it throughout the show experiences that we've had and the things that have been happening. It's crazy. And we're going to go into deep depth into We're going to stitch it together like a paranormal quilt. Yeah. Well, at least we're going to try to. (laughs) Uh, but before we get to that, let's get into our first segment of the show, which is the the psychic word of the week. And now, the psychic word of the week. So this week, our psychic phrase of the week uh, comes from the Encyclopedic Psychic Dictionary by June Bletzer. Rest in peace, honey buns. Um, And uh, we have flipped through the pages as usual. And where we stopped uh, was in the letter S. And I looked down and the phrase that caught my eye was slaying in the spirit. Okay. What, now, like, without looking, like, like you're slaying it. Yeah, is that, I don't know, but it, it, yeah, it's not a sleigh ride. This is S L A Y. And what immediately, without even reading the definition, is it? Rem- it just makes me think of those, it, the Crusades, 
were slaying oh, in the spirit, spirit, right? Yeah. Like, it wasn't, you know, I I was just, I was possessed by God. <laughs> well, it makes me think of, girl, you slaying it. You slaying it, girl. Uh, but here's here's what uh, June Bletzer says about slaying in the spirit. And these all have, this has hyphens through the whole thing, so technically it's one word. Okay. Um, anyways, it says, to lightly touch the forehead of an individual with the first two fingers of the right hand and cause the individual to fall to the floor unharmed with the intention that he or she will receive a bolt of Holy Spirit energy performed by an evangelist at a charismatic meeting that is designed to stir the emotions of the members. Individual falls backward in a prone position, fully relaxed instantaneously with the touch. Workers help to ease the slain individuals to the floor as they are touched one after another. They lie on the floor until normal consciousness returns purpose is to receive a physical healing or a change in attitude not all who fall backward are healed there is a theory that says that it is a group elemental that is built through loud rhythmic music and emotional ploy from the leader beforehand composed to put the group in unison of thought groups expectation and desire for the healings and falling backwards cause it to happen yeah you know it's it's funny because i think earlier today or maybe earlier this week you and I were talking about um, the fact that what if the Holy Spirit, as it is related to it in mm-hmm. Christianity, is really just a group elemental? Because it seems like For the sure. Holy Spirit is only really called on as being moving when it's around a large group of people uh, that are kind of in unison, mm-hmm. you know, chanting or yep. whatever. So, yeah, it, you know, and we were speaking with the theologian and he, uh, you know, I, we had talked about um, how if Jesus were to come back today, you know, would anyone recognize that it was Jesus? No, just like the Jews said, no, I think Christians would do the same thing. And I said, what if it takes another God showing up? Right. Is what I told the theologian. Yeah. I said, what if it's another God? And he says, well, another God has already shown up. And I was like, oh, really? And I'm waiting for some yeah. joke or something. He said the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and to me, that's funny. But I mean, he. He legit yeah. means it. And if you think about that in terms of the Holy Trinity, I mean, that kind of makes sense because he does. He says after Christ came back, he made way for the Holy Spirit to yeah. show up. And so that's just a short period of time for me. So I, that's why I don't say yeah. that, that. That was my biggest reason for saying no was only because, like, dude, it was like three days. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, we have a couple hundred years before the new right, guy shows exactly. up. Uh, but I don't know. It's a very interesting theory, something I'd never heard before that I thought was very interesting. And uh, But going back to that, to the, the slaying in the spirit, I'd never heard it called slaying in the spirit. Yeah. But it makes sense. I mean, you think of those Benny Hinn shows yeah. and stuff like that, like, where he, I mean, he does, boom, they fall. Down. Right, you're healed. Right, I mean, it, I think we've talked about it before. That that funny uh, YouTube video of, of uh, Ryu or whatever doing his thing, and then the people yes. fall backwards. Ooh, ah, <laughs> ooh, ah, yeah, ooh, ah. <laughs> so. yeah uh, man, there's a whole Street Fighter thing with all the all the healings and all the different Street <laughs> Fighter characters and stuff. It's so funny. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's like, you know, I, I legit think some people were healed. I don't think that it was the power of God as much as I think it was the power of suggestion. You've got a hundred thousand people in this auditorium all believing and wanting you yeah. to get healed. And if you, you know, believe in something like the secret or something like that, imagine not only your want going out right. to the universe, but a hundred thousand people in an enclosed space. And in, and in Wicca, we raise the cone of power. Well, here's a hundred thousand right. people raising the cone of power. Um, and thought, just thought alone could change that. So, well, and it's something I've been, uh, I've been reading a book about, uh, frequency and about how to, how to change your own. That's in- that movie with Dennis Quaid, right? <laughs> it's funny because you got she got the novelization. Because she talks about that movie. In oh, the does book. she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good movie. It's a good movie. <laughs> but, um, but she, you know, talks about, uh, raising your internal frequency, uh, to a higher level, mm-hmm. to, which would allow you to basically change the, your physical reality almost. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that it talks about that you, that, that those who can raise their frequency can often do is self heal. Yes. Uh, you know, I think if Santosh was on, he would say that as well. That a lot of those old Yugi, Yugis, Yugios, <laughs> those yeah. yogis and gurus believe the same thing. And, and much Tibetan lore also believes that, that there is this new age, um, idea as well that is that changing your frequency. In fact, I mean, when I use Reiki, it is essentially about changing the frequency. Yeah. Um, so I 100% agree with that. And I know both of us are, um, 
watching ancient civilizations on Gaia right now, and they yep. talked about the original uh, Aeon or goddess, which was Sophia, and she was essentially a frequency. Right. Like, <laughs> right. Like, well, and it's the whole the whole book, The Eighth Tower by John Keel, mm-hmm. is talking about those different frequencies and about how the ultra terrestrial operates on a higher frequency yep. and they manipulate us with use of frequencies and all that kind of stuff. So, so I- anyways, all, all of that to be said, we, we got way off topic, <laughs> but, uh, but all of that slaying in the spirit, <laughs> <laughs> but all of that to be said that if in the moment there's enough people in the room and the energy is right in the room, you could temporarily raise that frequency enough to self heal. Sure. Is, is I, I, I mean, that's why it's like, you know, I, I don't think thoughts and prayers help, but I, I bet you you get a hundred people in the same room doing thoughts and prayers at my. Well, all, all <laughs> prayer is is positive intent. Yeah, exactly. So if you're putting that positive intent, that positive energy out into the universe for something to happen, why not? And to uh, lightly, just even lightly touch on what we're going to be talking about tonight in terms of synchronicities. Here I flip to this random slaying in the spirit, and down at the bottom is Group Elemental, which we talked about a few weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, ha- we would have hit that and been like, what's a Group Elemental? elemental. Right. <laughs> right. We would have wondered. Right. Exactly. It came in the order it needed to How come. weird. Yeah. I mean, we legit are flipping through this and just finding, you know, anything so funny. Uh, but yeah, I'll shut up on that and we'll get moving on because I could talk about this all yeah. day. Well, we will. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I want to get into uh, some spooky news. I got something kind of sci-fi to talk about. Sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Sci-fi. Ryuken. All right. So on this week's spooky news, uh, like I said, I've got something a little sci-fi-ish. Um, this comes from space.com. This is one of my faves. Uh, you know, all the cool, uh, astronomical stuff is on here. Yep. Um, it says mysterious blue fireball streaks above Western Australia, puzzling astronomers. Now, one of the reasons this stood out to me was that a few years back, um, uh, myself, uh, and a few friends of mine went on a thing here in Louisville called danger run. Where it's basically like a scavenger hunt and it leads you to two different haunted houses. And yep. if you, you know, whoever has the less mile or the closest mileage wins some crap. I've never won, so I don't know. Did you know that one year, uh, Justin and I were like in the finalists? Wow. Uh, a, a guy that I used to work with, a friend of mine, was the very first winner. <laughs> um, but yeah, I didn't know that. But I love, I, that's the first time I ever did it was back in the high yeah. school we did it that. And then now, um, we do it almost every year for some friends of mine. But anyways, one of the times we were out, we saw this huge blue fireball, uh, that came down and we were just, holy crap. And it turned out to be a meteor of some sort. Um, it was all over the news and stuff like that. But that's why this grabbed me because this says it puzzled astronomers. The one that we saw did not puzzle astronomers. Um, so, and there is a video of it, um, as well as a picture you can see there just, you can see it, Josh. Yep. But it, I mean, it's just a, a blue streak essentially in the sky. Um, but what it says here is that a streak of blue light flashed across the sky on Monday, surprised Western Australia's night owls and befuddled the astronomy community. God, I love the word befuddled. <laughs> uh, the blue fireball was seen at 1 a.m. local time on June 15th, according to ABC News. It was a really spectacular observation, Glenn Nagel, the education and outreach manager at the CSIRO NASA tracking station in Canberra told the news agency. Sightings were reported across the remote region as well as in the country's northern territory and in South Australia, Nagel said. Many observers caught the phenomenon on video. The fireball streaks steadily across the sky. At first, it appears orange or yellow, with a short tail streaming behind it, and then after a few seconds, the bulk of the fireball lights up blue. Now, scientists are not quite sure what object was burning up in the atmosphere to create the brilliant light show, according to ABC News. Some amateur astronomers speculated that the object could be human-made debris, perhaps from a recent rocket launch. But that seems unlikely, says Renee Sayers, a research ambassador at Curtin University's Space and Science Technology Center. A fireball flashes across the sky in Western Australia's remote Pilbara. 
uh, they reference. And uh, Sayers says, when space junk re-enters the atmosphere, what we tend to see is sort of like crackles and sparks. This is due to the fact that there's stuff burning up. So you've got solar panels going all over the place. You've got hunks of metal moving around. Now, the fireball seen in Western Australia, on the other hand, glided smoothly through the sky. That makes it more likely to be a natural space object. The blue color, according to Nagel, indicates a high iron content. Yeah. And many meteorites, space rocks that survive their fiery trip through Earth's atmosphere, are high in iron. Some may be the cores of ancient asteroids, even, according to the Natural History Museum in the UK. Now, Sayers said that the fireball looked similar to another spectacular meteor sighted in Australia in 2017, but even that fireball whooshed across the sky, and instead of hitting the ground or burning up in the atmosphere, it bounced back into space. Now, the June 15th fireball may have been another grazing encounter, but we may never know. Hmm. It, when you were reading that story, it reminded me of... Have you ever seen the movie The Right Stuff? Yes. So <clears throat> there's a scene where John Glenn is orbiting the Earth, and you see... I can't remember the two astronauts that are supposed... You know, they're in Australia at the listening station. Frickin' frack. And there's this fire going, you know. <laughs> yeah. And John Glenn reports that there are these swirling um, uh, objects around his capsule. He can see them through the window. And all this was supposed to be while he was orbiting over Australia. Mm -hmm. And I actually went and looked real quick, and I found this is the quote that he said. He said, this is John Glenn. This is Friendship 7. I'll try to describe what I'm when I'm in here. I'm in a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up. They're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They were round a little. They're coming by the capsule. They look like little stars. A whole shower of them coming by. Wow. So it's just very cool that that happened, happened over top of Australia and then here they've got these two fireballs that come in over top of Australia. Well, and even then, you know, there are many theories that the Aborigines, uh, Aboriginals were the original people of the Earth. Hmm. Um, and, you know, their their origins and their myths and things like that speculate that as well. Um, so, it, you know, maybe yeah. it's like, hey, we're coming home or we're... <laughs> <laughs> or it's just like that movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy. It's just a Coke bottle coming down on an African <laughs> tribe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so very, very interesting. Not not as spooky as spooky can be, but just the idea that they found no particles, they found nothing. Yeah. The astronomers looked; they couldn't figure out what it was. They're just assuming it's a meteorite. But you know, I mean, I also wonder how much how much stuff really probably enters our atmosphere that we never see. Time. We never yeah. see it. You yeah. know, so this is just this happened to be one that we caught yeah you know? well and it's funny because just the other day uh yesterday or the day before uh, as we're recording here um was national meteorite day and uh it was super cloudy and you couldn't <laughs> see anything and i was like is it my father and i law and i were like does this happen at the same time every year you know or does this coincide with yeah. like uh you know play pl placate placentas placades what um, are you talking about over there <laughs> <laughs> the meteor showers there's like the play play roots one and the measure one <laughs> if you just mumble and yep. change it. <laughs> <laughs> this is why i do the hosting yeah. mainly this is, this is this, i'm gonna take that approach on all the names that i have to read in future, uh, in future, just mumble it, man. <laughs> or just or make up derogatory <laughs> names instead of play placides, placentas, yeah. whatever you want to do. But yeah, anyways, I'm going to stop that before it gets out of hand. <laughs> uh, you're welcome, uh, blanket huggers, for yeah. my life. Uh, but yeah, so let's move on and get into our uh, next segment, which is the UFO sighting of the week. All right, Josh, what do we got this week from our uh, resources of UFO sightings? W what are we digging into? All right, so this was actually in Buckeye, Arizona. Ooh. On um, Monday, June 8th. Nice. So just, just a few weeks back. Yep. I was riding my bicycle while meditating on the act of inviting an intelligence that could potentially hear me from open communication and contact. I told them that I bring a message of love and peace and pure desire for understanding and learning. I acknowledge that they, whoever can hear me, will have say over how the communication happens. I was meditating on that really hard, and when I stopped my bike, I looked up 
and there were multiple golden balls, points of light glittering in the sky. Some remained stationary, some moved around, and some of them seemed to jump across the sky. I was able to record some video. I have seen these several times before, and I'm happy to provide more information upon request. Let's find this dude. <laughs> uh, here, here's the funny thing. is it, It's interesting that this coincides with our topic tonight, because this time last year, I would have laughed at the first part. Yeah. And now I'm doing that almost nightly. Yeah. I am also, you know, trying to change my frequency. And, right. And trying to let them know, much like Indrid Cold would have, you know, or how Woody spoke to Indrid and, and yep. things like that. Like, I, I try to do the same thing, you know, because there there is beginning to be so much more, I don't want to say evidence because skeptics will be mad, but uh, stories of this this telepathic yeah. um, sense of frequency uh, in terms of speaking to them yeah. more so, so than just using your voice. So something I watched on um, on Gaia earlier this week or late last week is called First Contact. Mm-hmm. I watched and, that as well through your recommendation. <laughs> and uh, it follows or, or it's about a man named Daryl Anka yep. who channels an interdimensional being that goes by the name Bashar, although it, he he explains that Bashar isn't really his name; it's more or less a, a title. Yeah, a moniker that right. he used uh, that he thinks because of his own, uh, I believe, Persian background. Yeah, or, or some, something, but either Persian or Arabic background. Yeah. But basically, that the word basically means messenger. Yeah. Uh, so, anyways, uh, all that to be said, uh, it, it made me think of um, something that uh, that Bashar talks about in that. You know, I won't. I won't ruin it for anybody who wants to go to Gaia and check it out because it's a it's a great documentary, mm-hmm. I, which I would love to actually go see. This oh yeah, live. to see him in person would be fantastic. <laughs> if if Daryl Anka or any of his people happen to be listening, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but so one of the things that Bashar says is that it, early on his people had to uh, encounter humans or work with humans to for his, he he talks about why I don't want to. To spoil the the fun for anybody, but he says in the early in the early days, uh, his people lacked emotion and they lacked compassion, mm-hmm. and so when they would interact with humans, often in although they didn't mean it in in a in a aggressive way, because they didn't understand how it would be perceived, abductions and a lot of those things, a lot of those negativity things came about, and so he said, now they've progressed to the point where. Uh, people who were early abductees are now embracing mm-hmm. their contact with his people because they understand what their intention is. Yeah, and, and we still think there are, there are others that are still doing all of that. And in fact, he talks about coming from a different dimension. So the uh, abductors here could be from our own dimension as well. Yeah. It's, very, it's all very, very interesting. Um, I highly recommend. Just one of the... Many. I mean, just many great show. I mean, I have I have watched a lot of, th- and I'm not. I know we have an ad for a guy, and, th- <laughs> and don't don't get me wrong. This is not me trying to get you to get guy, but I mean, but it's to awesome. Be, but to be honestly, I mean, I've watched a, a number of programs on Gaia, and I have not found one that was disappointing. Yeah, same. Uh, we've both watched the crap out of it. Um, but what I wanted to mention was it's it's interesting because. <laughs> is already going to be a lead into our conversation because it's interesting how some of the things that I'm now finding fit into ultra terrestrials and ufology and things like that were things that as a new age Wiccan pagan type person was already doing just differently. I was already channeling. I was already speaking to my higher self, my spirit guides. And it's like, all I have to do is like when you're looking at a microscope and you flip the lens mm-hmm. to get the different view on it, that's what's happening here yeah. is I'm able to flip the lens and go, oh, the, the, this is what I was doing. I just wasn't looking at it from this perspective. Right. And some of this makes more sense. Like, and we'll, I'll save it. We'll get into that. But yeah. yeah, I just wanted to say that. Yeah. That very, very interesting indeed. And I love that. Uh, I, I loved the guy's description of the glowing orbs, um, how some were stationary, yeah. some were moving around, some were bouncing. Right. Like, um, because we've seen reports before oh, yeah. of these, these glowing like orbs. So 
Not not Keith type not, orbs. Yeah. Orbs. Those are owls. Right. So <laughs> or dust particles. <laughs> or bugs. Yeah. Um, but so. yeah, very very different because we're seeing these with our eyes, right? right. Um, but yeah. Ooh, lordy, man. <laughs> All right. So is that a good segue? Yeah. Well, I oh, want to get into creepy, creepy ketchup. ketchup. Yeah, because I got a few things I want to talk about before we get into okay. the long haul of creepy ketchup, essentially. Uh, but yeah, let's move quickly into creepy ketchup. Creepy ketchup. Creepy ketchup. Creepy ketchup. Creepy ketchup. Y'all, it's creepy. Uh, so yeah, so, uh, I'll move quickly so we can get into this. Okay. Um, but it's just a very interesting week. Like I said, I, I spent some time with my sister. Um, while I was there, my wife lost two friends within days of each other, mm. uh, or within a day of each other. I mean, back to back. Mm. Sorry for um, that. Yeah. I, I didn't know either of them. Um, but I, we did go to one of the funerals cause they also did the funeral the exact same time. So it was like flipping a coin, had to go to one. Right. Um, but, uh, while we were, so, you know, I, I've said this before, my wife is, is coming around to a lot of the stuff. Yep. Um, but for the most part, she's pretty skeptical, uh, and stuff doesn't usually happen to her. But while we were there, she pulls me aside and she's like, Stefan, somebody just whispered into my ear and I'm, I feel bad cause I can't remember what they said. Um, it, it was something kind, whatever it mm-hmm. was. But she was like, Stefan, no one was around. Hmm. She was just like, it was no one's voice in this house. And it was directly in my ear. And she's like, it gave her the willies. Like, mm. it really spooked her, but in a good way. Yeah. Um, we were uh, going to be reading tarot. My other sister came into town, Trisha, so everybody knows about her. Um, and so we were also going to do the Ouija board and things like that. We never ended up getting to the Ouija board because the tarot took forever. But Trisha's whole, or I mean, uh, Sarah's whole big thing was that she wanted to see who it was. Like, she was, like, so stoked to find out who it was. Yeah. Um, and I asked her if she thought it was either one of her friends. She said no. She said she didn't think she knew who it was. And so she wondered if it was someone in the house. Um, now where my sister lives is kind of like a neighborhood filled with kind of like really, really nice condo homes. Yeah. And so there's a lot of old people. So, I mean, who knows? Could have been somebody who passed away. Um, my sister's adopted dad died in 2001. He did show up. My sister can speak to spirits. He did show up during her tarot reading. So it's possible it was him. I mean, could be anything. Or it honestly could have been a loved one of Sarah's that was trying to comfort her and her loss. Yeah. And, and that's what I told her too. So, uh, that was very interesting. So that wasn't my thing, but that was definitely hers. Um, but then, you know, like just being there, I mean, I had just all sorts of feelings and, and taps and pulls. Like my blanket got pulled off a couple times. I kept expecting her dog to be there. No, he was up or she was upstairs, um, you know, while I was sleeping and, and things like that. And then, of course, um, you know, I had a dream. Uh, last night about uh, Alan Greenfield, the author of the uh, Complete Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts. And this is like the f- the f- second or third dream I've had about him in the past two weeks. Now, granted, I just finished his book. Yeah, he's, <clears throat> he's fresh on your mind. He's fresh on my mind. And I told you I kept seeing him everywhere. Like, if you've watched Hellier, you see this standard kind of, you know, middle-aged man, glasses, Longish-ish kind of grayish hair, yeah. um, and kind of like those Hawaiian or bowling type shirts, yeah. You know, <laughs> and like I, I, I've seen this dude everywhere. Like I'm like Alan, <laughs> you know, like, and so he is definitely on my mind. And uh, we've got a really cool announcement we'll bring up uh, into our topic, but like just very, very interesting. Just a heavy week full of light things, if that yeah. makes sense. I mean, it was daily. Daily, daily, daily. And then, of course, the second. So I've had a great week, though. Like, I mean, I have been like, you know, I I don't know how much I've shared this on here, but I, I, I suffer through ADHD and anxiety and depression and things like that, like a lot of us do. Um, but this week, I mean, I was on cloud nine getting to meet my sister. Yeah. We were swimming and we went to Ann Arbor and I got to go to my favorite bookstore and I found a really cool book, um, that I just found referenced in, in, uh, Greenfield's book, which yeah. I'm laughing at because like, it just grabbed my eye. I was like, oh, that's very interesting. And then, like, the very last chapter of Greenfield's book mentions that book. And I'm like, <laughs> go figure. Um, but anyways, yeah, so that happened. And then I get home. 
and my anxiety has been through the roof. Now, mm. granted, work's been kind of crazy. Yeah. I chipped my tooth on Sunday. There's, There's been some factors, but it, it I don't know. There, I just makes me wonder if I need to cleanse my, my uh, in-law's home, you know? Yeah. Like, Have you not done that? Not in a while. Not since they've been there. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Really, really weird. Just just hmm. a whole new weird feeling. And today was the first day that I felt better. So this is four days after I got back. Today was the first day I didn't have anxiety all day today. Interesting. Yeah. And work was just as crazy yeah. as it's been all week. So it wasn't like that changed. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Just I, I got a lot on my mind. And, you know, like, and I don't know how much of that is just infiltrating i guess yeah. in a way i mean one one sad thing is i was supposed to go to europe and now the u.s has been barred from europe so now i don't think we're going <laughs> which just yeah. sucks because i really wanted to see my brother um but you know just a couple things but at the same time it's like today i have felt just amazing like i don't hmm. know it's just weird so i don't know i don't know Maybe how creepy that is per se but <clears throat> well and in, in your your feeling amazing thing I mean, you and I have both said that we look forward to this day every week yeah. uh, of being able to do the show. And so maybe just knowing that you were going to get to do the show tonight was enough to maybe and, tip the scale. Yeah, and the fact that um, I have a day off tomorrow. Yeah. Well, that, that's good <laughs> so too. I get a three-day weekend. Right. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know dec- declaration day is this weekend. Yeah, so. it is. And uh, <laughs> so I it, I don't know. It, it's interesting because my therapist, I had, I had to change – uh, my time because I had another appointment that I double booked and then uh, I was like okay well I can't do the next week because I'm going to be in Michigan and I was like let's do next week she's like well I'm going to be out of town so it's been like it's going to be like three four weeks when I see her next week yeah. and I'm going to be like get ready honey I got a lot <laughs> to tell you <laughs> so so my creepy catch up I just have two items and they're really the same item that just that happened over two different mm-hmm. nights so um, I have had every night uh, some really crazy dreams that I don't really remember the next day. Like I remember bits and pieces, but the bits and pieces that I remember are stupid. <laughs> it's just like they it always are has nothing to do with anything, you know, retrospective or anything. So but um, one thing that I noticed uh, last night and the night before is I went to bed with. So we on our bed, we have the, uh, the undersheet and then like a light blanket and then the comforter. Okay. Uh, and we keep our house pretty cold at night because we like to sleep when it's cold. Um, <clears throat> so last night and the night before, um, or rather, I guess in the morning when I woke up, I woke up to find that the, my, the comforter was off of me. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you know, I'm, it's not uncommon for me to kick the comforter off, but usually every other time that I've woken up hot and, and rolled the comforter back, I've always like I remember doing that. I remember waking up and moving the comforter. Right, and it's uh, it's not like I threw it off my upper body. Like it, <laughs> like the entire comforter. It's not is, like you have my dog Kenobi pulling it off yeah. like he does to me. No, I mean it's like I, like I <laughs> moved the entire comforter off of me. Yeah. Um, well, what, what's really crazy is the first night that it happened, uh, I woke up at like four or something in the morning, and I realized that the comforter was off of me, and I had like this fleeting thought that I was abducted and placed back in my bed and then hmm. just they just kind of covered me up with the sheet and the blanket but not the comforter. Maybe you were slayed in the spirit. Maybe I was. And you got thrown <laughs> back into the bed. I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's I, interesting. I don't know, though. but still, but that's that's the only two things and it's again it's just more or less the the fact that I really for the last two nights I've almost um, blacked out if you will. Like yeah. it, like it just when I wake up in the morning, I have almost no memory of anything that happened. Like, I, I usually toss it because I wear a CPAP when I yeah. sleep, and it's very uncomfortable. Yes, I know. And, and the hose gets Whenever I, when I When I used to have to wear mine, somehow in the middle of every yeah. night, I took it off and didn't know it. <laughs> I mean, the hose gets wrapped everywhere. You know, I, I ended yeah. up like, you know, so anyways. So I, I Hashtag usually. Hashtag fat people problems. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I usually, I mean, I usually uh, toss and turn. And wake up several times throughout the night to readjust yeah. for how the hose and stuff is wearing for the mask. 
in the last two nights. I mean, it was just like nothing. Like I've gone to sleep and I've woke up the next morning. Interesting. And nothing. Sleeping hard. Those hard sleeps scare me. Um, but it reminded me of two quick other things. Um, first of all, I was I've been talking to Brad, of course, a lot. Um, he's been having a lot of crazy stuff happen to him. Uh, and one I just wanted to share real quick. Sorry if you were planning on sending that in, Brad. But the other night he he woke up with huge scratches along both sides of his arms. And uh, he didn't even notice his wife noticed it. Like, what the hell happened to you? And there are three. It's three scratches mm-hmm. on each side. And he is freaking out. He sent me pictures of it and everything. He's, like, totally freaked out about it, especially because stuff that's been happening to yeah. him lately, which I won't ruin for anybody because he wants to send it in. Um, but that was interesting. The other thing was, as I was talking to my mom, and you know how uh, we were talking to Santosh about uh, astral projection as well as abduction and things like that? They talk about how you get lifted up and you could fall back in, and that's how you wake up and you're like, oh, and it feels like you just got dropped. Right. I was talking to my mom, and she told me that when I was really, really little, she said I used to come into her room all the time saying that I just fell, but I was on the bed. And that she had seen me a couple times as she'd walk by, she'd hear me go, oh, and I would be bouncing. Yeah. Like... And you remember my story yeah. of possible abduction at that right. age. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> right? Like, uh, it was really weird to hear her say that because she was like, it happened a lot. Well, but I, but your story when you were abducted, like, you all disappeared, right? Like, yeah. You were missing. Yeah. Yeah, we were missing. But I'm just saying, it's like, if that happened, were there other instances of it happening yeah. before or after? Because I don't know when, you know, time for that because I was three yeah. to five years old. Right. Um, but yeah, it was just very interesting that she said that to me, hmm. you know, cause we had just recently had that conversation with Santosh and just, uh, yeah. yeah. And I and also in search of the, uh, the one with, uh, Zachary Quinto, um, the new version, not, yeah. not the Leonard Nimoy one. He, he meets this woman who has been abducted a million times and she wants him to feel what it feels like to get abducted. And that's exa- she referenced it the exact same way and had him do this, like, weightless lift and, and all this. Cra- mm. It was crazy. Uh, but, yeah, anyways, those were two random quick things I wanted to throw in there real quick before we get moving on. So let's move on because I'm ready to get talking. Okay. So we're going to get into our topic this week, which is, of course, our journey so far. Hey, everyone. Josh here. Do you feel like mainstream options for things such as yoga, meditation, or documentaries and films meant to expand your mind are lacking? Have you heard of Gaia? Gaia is the largest resource of consciousness expanding videos. Both Stefan and I have watched several of the series, documentaries, and films available on topics such as the secret space program, channeling interdimensional beings, and alien encounters. We're just now exploring the over 8,000 films, shows, and classes available to stream on your favorite devices. To get your 10-day free trial of Gaia, go to fearscapepodcast.com slash Gaia offer. Again, that's fearscapepodcast.com slash G-A-I-A offer. Okay, so yeah, here we are. We yeah. we have it's, we. <laughs> it's really, uh, and I was thinking about it. It's almost, um, it's almost come like it's almost been a year. I yeah. think since it started. Yeah, it's getting damn close. Yeah, and I, I mean, I just want to say thank you to our listeners for being interested in our stories. A lot of the feedback that we get from folks is their interest in our stories. People love creepy catch up. Probably more than any other segment. Yep. Um, just the fact that we have so much of it, um, which is great because, I mean, there's weeks we don't. I mean, we do not right. force this issue. I mean, it, it just stuff happens. Sometimes hey. we have dry spells and sometimes we have crazy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Some, like last week, it's like I had a light but heavy week. It was yeah. just nothing really big to talk about, but there was a lot of little things, right? So right. it's like... It was, a light, it was a light flow. It was, it was a light flow. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you guys for always yeah. listening and being intrigued. Um, but yeah, some of you did ask, especially some newer listeners asking, what's the whole story here? Like, how did you get yeah. to where you are? Um, cause we don't share everything on this podcast. So, uh, we forget sometimes that what we've talked about didn't happen while we were recording. Right. So there's, you know, there's a lot of gaps. Well, and, and, and also I think that, at least for me, um, 
I'm looking forward to really, like I said early on, to kind of trying to stitch it all together. Um, cause I, I do remember a lot of things that mm-hmm. have happened. Uh, but you're right. I don't remember what we've talked about, what we've shared, mm-hmm. uh, what we've kept internal. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a really good, you know, almost like a, a roadmap for how we have gotten to where we are. And the funny part is, is like, I feel like we've only like scratched the surface and that's telling with the fact that I'm about to live on the other side of the country, yeah. how I still feel like we've only scratched the surface, that bigger things are about to happen yeah. even with us in separate separate places. Well, and, and, and as, we'll, as we'll see as we start talking through these things, uh, I really feel like it, it, each time that something has happened, it has built upon itself. Yes. And um, just the – I mean, I hate to reference, but I mean – Hellier did not create the term synchronicities. And I mean, I've read it in every single damn book we've been reading. Right. But the synchronicities have been insane. Like between the books we're reading, the docs we're watching, the yeah. conversations we're having with us, with Santosh, with everybody, and then the, our guests coming on right. and having things that are expanding on the things we didn't even tell anybody about. Right. It, it, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. Oh, just, you know, like the, the theories that even just you and I share, like, yes. we, you know, we're in messenger all day talking about things and stuff. And the theories that you and I share that no one else knows about right. those theories. And then we watch a documentary or something and they're talking about the talking same about damn the theories. Same thing or we're reading a, a book <laughs> that was written 50, 50 years, years ago yeah. or a book that was like barely published. Right. With the same thoughts and the same yeah. ideas that just. Just feed that narrative for us. I mean, and I try not to have a singular lens on things, but that's the interesting thing is there are many lenses, but they're all pointing towards the same thing. Yeah. That's what's crazy. Like we're coming at it from a UFO perspective, an ultra terrestrial perspective, a religious perspective, a spiritual perspective, a pagan perspective, an occult perspective, all these different perspectives, And they're all like, they're all lining up. They're all lining up, which was itself a sort of theory we had towards right. the beginning that all supernatural paranormal things are related. Right. Right. And it's just, whew. <laughs> so, so let's, let's take a, yeah. a look at kind of, so, I, so as, as we started to prepare for this episode, um, I, I sat down and made a little document of kind of where I think, um, where I think things started in this journey, and I, and I and I don't want to diminish the fact that you have been on this journey mm-hmm. uh, for a long time. I have been on a similar yet probably not as acknowledged journey for right. a long time, but it only seems to be that once we're on the journey together, that things really started to click into right. place. And it's interesting because you know Santosh and I have been friends just a few years shorter than you and I have been friends. Um, but pagan wise, him and I have been friends almost since the get go. And him and I have always joked that our lives are very parallel, even though they are different. Um, but because we're into a lot of the same stuff, there's parallel things that happen. And I think some of that fits into that group mind. Um, that, and even improv feeds into this, right? right? This idea of group mind. Um, but in a lot of ways, I feel like your track just curved in between our tracks too, because now even Santosh is like, Josh, dude, this is what we're going through. And it's like, you know, and uh, you know, you're just a train car behind on some things. And it's interesting for Santosh and I to go, gosh, these were things that we felt when we were actually, all of us were at Campbellsville. um, But we put into our pockets um, because we didn't have the understanding nor the experience mm-hmm. to understand what was going on. And it's like when your train showed up, it like, it like emptied those pockets out for Santosh and I. Mm. And we were like, so that's what this meant. And then, you know, there's this wizened old man that both Santosh and I are as we look at you going, Oh, remember when we first felt this way? And, <laughs> and I mean, it's like puppy love, you know, right. when you first get into it, everything is like, Holy crap. I swear. I just felt somebody touch my shoulder. And yeah. it's the most amazing thing, you know, cause you do, you get to a point where you're like, yeah, I just had another thing touch my so- shoulder, man. It was, <laughs> you know, and it's like, you forget, but then it's like these, these, you jumping on, on this middle track, it's like it opened these doors and then this podcast and then just everything. Um, and, and a lot of it, you know, had to do with John Keel and Hellier. 
Um, but it, it started even before then. Yeah, so I, I think, for me, I, I track it back to um, the dream that I had before I recorded the first episode with you. So we recorded the first episode, I believe, at the end of August, mm-hmm. which which actually aired on September 11th. Um, and so the, probably the week before, so two weeks before it aired, I had a dream, which I shared in the mm-hmm. in the getting spooky with Josh, you know, kind of uh, episode, the new co-host right. episode. Um, and uh, you know, in, in for those who who may not have gone back and listened or, or who are new to the show, so in that dream, I was uh, standing in the field uh, in my grandparents uh, in my grandparents' farm in Shelby County, Kentucky, and um, there was an entity like standing next to me, and I was. In comparison to the entity, I was small, so I I interpreted interpreted that as being I was a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when I looked up in the sky, there was like a triangular craft, uh, kind of partially blocking out the sun. And the entity uh, spoke to me, although not with their mouth, and said, you know that that uh, that I was a hybrid, and I was going to have some medical problems because of that, and and so on and so forth. And so and then I woke up, and like I said, then we did the the show. And so for me, um, that was kind of uh, the first uh, starting point of 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 all this kind of stuff kicking off. Well, and it, and well, it's it, like when I read tarot. One of the things that I do in the spread that I do is one of the uh, first cards we read is the past. And the past, I always reference as being the root cause, the root that affects the rest of the reading, that this happened in the past and this is why everything is leading that way. And that's what this was for you. This was the root. If I were to read you, I would say that was the root that led to everything else and is leading to everything else. So one of the other things I'm 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 reading this book right now by um, uh, Penny... Uh, Pieter or something like that. I can't remember her last name, but um, it's uh, it's all about changing your frequency. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that she, that she says is is that as you um, start to shift towards raising your frequency, you'll start to encounter things because you're you're changing yourself. You're changing your physical nature. And some of the things that you'll encounter is that you'll have. Uh, uh, sup- uh, repressed memories will come to light. Yes, um, you could potentially have spikes in where you previously didn't have much ADD or ADHD. Mm-hmm. It could all of a sudden pre- start to present itself. You could have look what happened to me. <laughs> where you didn't have you <laughs> yeah. know um, depression maybe so much before. Now all of a sudden it starts to present itself. So you know anxiety and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And it's and it's just really interesting that perhaps before we even started on the path. I had, um, in my mind, committed to being on the path. And so, therefore, the changes in myself had started. The changes in my frequency yeah. had started, which brought forth this uh, pot- you know, potential of a suppressed memory, which is really what it felt like. It, it didn't feel like a dream. It felt like something that I had experienced, which I had forgotten, and that now I was remembering. The way the way I've had dreams like that, and the way that I, the way I say that it feels like, as if it is as if you are standing in a picture in a newspaper in a Harry Potter world, like that's the way it has always felt like to me. It's like because things are moving, but they're also stuck, right? It's yeah. like it's this frozen moment that moves. Well, and I, uh, and I definitely, so. you know, in 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 that dream, I was myself. Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of times that I have dreams. I, I have had dreams like that in the past where I feel like I'm witnessing an event, but I'm usually witnessing it from a third person perspective. Like mm-hmm. I see myself doing whatever. This was very much, I was myself doing this activity. Yeah. So. And to, to pull back a little bit for me, you know, when Brad and I started this show, both of a uh, uh, Brad first. And you know, and I, I'm a big believer that, um, if you're, if you're, oh, I, I'm really digging this term frequency. It's like, so if your frequency is already open, right, someone else's experience can reopen it, so to speak, and push things in your general direction. Yeah. Um, because Brad came onto the show and had some very, very interesting, um, night hags, which is where creepy ketchup came from. 
was this whole idea because they were one after another for a while. Mm. And all of a sudden, I hadn't had night hags in quite some time. And all of a sudden, I was getting them again. Um, and But our show was focused mainly on ghosts and poltergeists and, and those things. Um, and then one... I don't, I don't, I don't remember how it happened, but, um, we read something or, or Brad in one of his, his night visions there, uh, we established that it could have been extraterrestrial, mm. um, that there was some theory in the fact that it might be extraterrestrial because I think he saw himself on like a, 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 a surgical table or, mm. or something along those lines. I can't remember. Um, and then we started kind of looking towards that and, um, this, this whole idea of extraterrestrials started kind of to be put on the forefront for me. Um, I think I think Brad backed off of it a hair. He had some other things that were happening and things like that. But I know that by the time you came on board, I was starting to already move in that direction, hmm. which was interesting for the dream you had the week before. Right? It's, right. it's just that synchronicity. Synchronicity. You know, yeah. and and and. That to me was my starting point was the night hags for me and this idea that it might be extraterrestrial related or now maybe UT related. Right. Um, that, that kind of started me on the path. And then, then I discovered Hellier and, and so yep. on. But we had other things that happened first. Yeah. So one of the very first things that we did when you came on board was, uh, we investigated the uh, the place that I do improv all the time, the Shakespeare pub called The Bardstown, right. which is a play on the words because there's a road called Bardstown Road that leads to the city of Bardstown. And so since it was on Bardstown Road, he's a big Shakespeare fan, right. thus The Bardstown. Right. <laughs> Brilliant. I love plays yeah. on words. He's a theater guy. Love it. Love you, Doug Shetty. Um, but yeah, we he gave yeah. us permission. To go do that. And in fact, we were supposed to have like two or three other people join right. us, and they bailed at they the last minute, including show. you, Brad, calling you out. Um, <laughs> bailed on us at the last minute, and that's okay, because I think everyone that was supposed to be there was supposed to be there, yeah. except for Mitch, because he slept the whole time. Well, he was um, there. He was there. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Mitch. Um, but it was us, it was Naoma, it was Mitch, and uh, Clint Parks. Clint, yep. Um, Clint was great. I really like Clint. Yep. Um, but yeah, like uh, some interesting things happen. I'll let you start with yours because mine gets a little deeper. So, I mean, I f- for me, most of that evening uh, was uneventful. Yeah, because a- and at that point, you've never really had any ghosty experiences or anything other like that. than what I had at my grandparents' farm, right? You know, and we didn't. We we I had that group in that did an investigation there. And I, the whole time, I thought, you know, this is a joke. Yeah. Uh, well, they had like twenty people. Like, how do you do an investigation yeah. with twenty people? But anyways, so, um, so yeah, so up until that point, you know, I number one, I had uh, not a lot of experience, and number two, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and so, the other thing that I had started to do with at that point in time was experiment with my own internal energy. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. So, you know, at one point in time, you and I were sitting in the attic. All the lights were off. We were trying to do the attic, first of all, didn't even know that attic existed. <laughs> I've been performing there for 10 years, and I didn't even know there was a door that went up there. <laughs> Creeped me out. But, we, you know, we were trying to do that attic and trying to do some some EB, EVPs. And, and um, you know, you were like, you were saying you see, were seeing something moving mm-hmm. over by the furnace. And and I honestly started getting like really freaked out. Yeah, you did. So I uh, I internally started generating like this what, the whitest light that I could think of. <laughs> and then you're like, man, I don't know what happened. All the activity uh, dropped off. Dropped. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so I was like, well, I started generating all this white light. Like, oh, that's what it did. You killed it. So because <laughs> one of the things that I learned um, uh, uh, from a, a non skeptical ghost hunter was to trust what you're seeing because if you if you don't question it and you trust it you're manifesting it and you're giving it energy and yeah. it's going to grow and that's what I've always done and Naoma was Naoma I swear to god her and I have been uh siblings in another life <laughs> like I mean she believes the same thing and it's like you get up there and you do you have to just trust what you see because there's nothing else you can do right and 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 that's what it is. And then you start to feel it. You can see it in your mind and, and you just go for it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there was rustling. There was all sorts of stuff. 
and even Naoma and them had an instance. Yeah. Uh, Naoma and I, all, both together, we had an instance up in the attic. I mean, the attic was spooky ooky. But, I mean, you know, I think that we got a feeling uh, at that location, or at least say we, you and Naoma got a feeling that there was at least maybe a woman, a small, like, maybe child mm-hmm. or something, and then um, a, a guy who, uh, you know, was was uh, not a nice guy. No, not at all. And uh, Naoma, interestingly enough, Naoma and I came up with that separately, which was very creepy. Huh. Um but yeah, it was really, really interesting, and we had a cool instance in the in the green room back there. Just some stuff, you know, going on uh, during that. Yep. Um, we were using a, a ghost hunting tool uh, that had some interesting uh, results. Uh, I don't remember all this. Go back and listen to the episode. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what was really, really interesting was later on, um, I I felt this urge to channel. Uh, and looking back on it, it's exactly what it was. Yeah. Um, we felt something was up. We just, we felt something was going on with this woman as, as if she was trapped, that there was this possibility that this child was hers and he was stuck and that they couldn't get to the light and that they were being held down essentially yeah. by this man. And, um, but we couldn't get the correct information and I just, I, I couldn't stop it. I ran to the Ouija board, which we hadn't touched that night and I began channeling and my, uh, it, it wasn't your normal channeling. I didn't invoke, I didn't become, I didn't trance and become them, but my hands were her hands yeah. and it was moving so fast. I've never Ouija'd by myself. Like that's not a thing I've ever done. And I, it was moving so fast. And I knew there were the right words because they were popping in my head before I would see them spelled out. Yeah. And um, and I'm sitting there going, God, Josh is going to think I'm a freaking weirdo. But I couldn't stop. I couldn't well, stop. And see, that, that whole time, so I I had picked up, because we had some dowsing rods, mm-hmm. right? And they were the kind that, like, the part that you hold on to is separate from the part yeah. that turns. And so it's like I'm sitting there holding these. And they cross, like, directly in front of me. Uh, I get these cold chills all yeah. over my body. You know, at some point, at certain points of time, like my name came up in yeah. the conversation. Um, so I start like internalizing, picturing this white light and you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and I mean, it was just a, it was just a very, uh, for lack of a better term, eye opening experience for me. And what's interesting is, is that whatever Naoma, myself and you, and maybe Clint and maybe Mitch is snoring. Um, but whatever we did, felt like we were able to get the woman and her child to move to the light and be free of yep. this man. Um, because Doug has said he has not seen the visage of the female who he would see on the camera all the time. Mm. That's who he would smell her perfume and yep. all. has not seen that, but the man yeah. has still been there. And so that was very telling. Um, that what we did worked yeah, right <laughs> so so I mean, but yeah so that so so that for me was and so if I, I look at the dream and the starting of the show is like a uh, opening the door right yeah. um, then that experience was uh, almost like an, a, an affirmation that I was in the right place I was moving on the right path um, and, and much it, like I always say it's like once you turn on the uh, supernatural muscle in your brain, you don't turn it off. Yeah. Um, you might be able to put a blanket over it, but you don't turn it off. And a lot of times that door gets pushed open even more so, which is what I think happened. I mean, you know, we could talk about what next is when I saw the creature, the cryptid in your backyard. Yeah. Which I really wish that, you know, part of me wishes that I would have been out there to try to see what you were seeing, but, um, for, you know, first of all, I don't know that I could have seen it because th- that's still one. That's still something that I have have not had happen. I have not seen an apparition. I have not mm-hmm. seen any. Like I've, I've seen the effects. I've had feelings, but I've not seen it. And so, you know, something that that Santosh has talked to me about before is having my inner eye versus my outer, outer eye. So, mm-hmm. like being able to see it, even though I can't physically see you know yes. what i'm saying yes and so I, I i i wonder even if if you saw it not with your physical eye but right with your... well and, and i've said that it's like yeah sometimes you have to trust the image in your third eye like yeah. you have to trust that image um but no what i f- 
what I, I mean, I ran to my car. <laughs> Like, it scared me. And now the skeptic in me, of course, says that it could have just been a deer. Deer tend to can occasionally stand on their hind legs, but to just stand there for a while and watch you and, and turn watch its head you and turn its head. And it had long, I believe it had multiple sets of arms. It wasn't just, yeah, you know, but they were very long. And I just remember the deep, the deep glowing eyes and the antlers. Um, and it just reminded me so much of some sort of uh, Washu guy or Wendigo. I mean, I, I, I almost, I haven't I've never asked you to do it, but I would love it if you could, like, I mean, r- draw it. That one picture I sent you that one time that yeah. we have not been able to find since because it disappeared was exactly what I saw. Yeah. I mean, that was the best description of what I saw. Like, and even then it was mostly silhouetted, so uh, right. who knows? Right. Who knows? All I know is it was enough to scare me. Um, and maybe I was looking for it, cause at that point you thought you had seen something or thought something was yeah. in that forest line. Um, you know, maybe that opened, opened up my eye for me to see. I don't know. I haven't seen it since, and we've been back there. I don't see any <laughs> hoof prints. I don't. Yeah. I we mean, don't, we don't, uh, we often don't sit with our backs to the woods, but. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um. <coughs> So I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I know that that, like I said, this just started opening doors to things. And I think around this point is right around when we finally watched Hellier. Well, yeah. I watched it first. You watched it first. You're like, Josh, you got to watch this. Um, and I finally got around to watching it. And I watched, I mean, I think I binged the first season over like two days. Yeah, you, you moved on um, quick. And then the second season, watched it really fast. Uh, went back, watched it again with my wife. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I, I am like you. I'm trying to, you know, bring her into the fold, if you will, <laughs> with, uh, with your wife. Yeah. Um, but, um, sounds like we're swingers <laughs> <laughs> trying to bring her in a no. fold, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I watched it. I mean, I'm even, I've even, uh, watched a few episodes here and there, bits and pieces again. To, to try to pick up on things that maybe I didn't pick up on the first go around. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the, that watching Hellier really, um, well, I, so here I'm, I'm thinking about it now and, um, I don't know how much, um, I don't know how much I actually got out of Hellier other than, um, maybe the uh, some some um contributing information to some of my theories and that it turned me on to John Keel. Yes, and that's exactly what I was going to say. Um Hellier itself was amazing. We we've, we've had our own conversations um and you can listen to our episode on Hellier even though our opinions have changed on some of that. Yeah. But yeah, it's exactly what it did for me is that it it opened the doors to our our research. Yeah. Um is essentially what it did because Immediately, we were like, oh, yeah, John Keel. I've never read the Mothman prophecies. Maybe now's a good time. Yeah. Because we were like, oh, well, we need to eventually do an episode on Mothman and Injured Cold and stuff like that. So we we're like, cool, let's check it out. And then, I mean, and to me, it was truly at the end of the day, it was John Keel that, yeah, that opened because that referenced so many things. Oh, yeah. I. My only reference at that point was the movie, right. which is like a small part of what. Good lord, the book and just contains. the the way they portrayed injured cold, it was just ugh, yeah. whatever. Um, but yeah, that was my. So I had no idea it was this nonfiction yeah, like I mean, study. It, and really, and really, for me, um, if I have to think about the progress, the progression of things, uh, reading uh, Mothman prophecies and finishing it. Uh, and then the things that occurred for me after that was like a was like a springboard. I mean, yeah. it just it it just pushed me to like. So like, let's assume I was on level one. I, now I'm like level three. Like I, I jumped a whole yeah. A whole and level. then we were like Santosh, watch Hellier. Yeah, and he binged it in like two days, both yeah. series, both both seasons. And all of a sudden he's on board. He's reading the books right. with us, all the Keel books. And of course the Alan Greenfield episode. Right, that changed everything for me in Hellier because that's when I got a renewed interest in numerology and the occult. Yeah. Um, and that's when I first started getting my first inklings into the occult having to do with extraterrestrials or the term we learned ultra terrestrials. Right. 
Um, and just, it just crazy. And so we ended up buying, um, Greenfield's book and I, I tore through that and, uh, just, I just, I, the, and then we read Woody Derenberger's, Derenberger's, uh, Visitors from Lanulos, like, and seeing how that, and I just bought, uh, Gray Barker's book, The Silver Bridge. So I'm, I'm anxious to read his account on everything that well, happened in Point Pleasant. Well, and you know, and it, it's and it's my reading of of Keel's uh, Mothman prophecies that leads me to believe that Mothman was not a cryptid. Oh yeah, I'm 100% with you on that. And anyone that reads that book and comes out thinking that it's a cryptid did not read that the book. book. Yeah, they watch the uh, movie. <laughs> yeah, and that that tells me all you've ever done is just read your own lore or watch the movie. Even we, you know, listener out there, I know you're out there. It's like you even kind of getting mad at Josh saying it was a cryptid. There's there's you know tracks, there's things, and blah 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 blah. I, I, st- I still feel like our theory fits our theory. I mean, it still could be a man in a spacesuit that yeah. needs to eat. That needs to, right. <laughs> you know, like right. he could still have tracks. Um. Yeah, I don't. So it'll be interesting to see if Gray Barker's account uh, describes Mothman differently. Yeah, I'm very interested. Though I know him and Keel were BFFs, right? Um, as was uh, Darren Berger. So I, I read this. So I just recently got uh, his daughter Tanya's um, book Beyond Lanulos, um, which is a follow up. It's Beyond Lanulos, our 50 years with uh, Indrid Cold. And um, there really wasn't a whole lot of new information, though it did talk about stuff that happened after the book, uh, his book came out and stuff like that. But one of the interesting things in the book was, and I had read this somewhere, was that Gray Barker originally was supposed to be the editor of the book. Huh. Um, he was taking his time because there was so much great information that Woody had given him. That he loved it. The original, and they talk about the original manuscript is gone. It's lost to time. It's lost to time. And, um, apparently it went way deeper. And then when Herbert, whatever his name is, uh, because Woody got impatient because at that point he had lost his job. And so he wanted this book deal. I don't blame him. He wanted this book deal to help provide for his family. Yep. And so he, he fired Gray. And moved to this other guy, and this guy shredded his stuff and added his own information, yeah. uh, essentially, you know, like they did to the Bible yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that. It's like added his own information because he didn't – he thought it was too fantastical, mm. so he he brought it back down. And if you've read the book – it's pretty fantastic. It's pretty fantastical. <laughs> yeah. So I'm kind of yeah. concerned at like, how fantastical what, what was, it? <laughs> yeah, what was it. But, yeah, it's like he got rid of that, and Gray has even said – it was phenomenal, the information that Woody had. Well, that, I mean, it, it talks about, you know, and, and I don't want to get too far off topic here, but but it talks about in, in Visitors Lanulos that, uh, you know, they talk about how they how they communicate telepathically. And, and, and uh, Indrid says, oh, it's so easy. I'll tell you how. It makes me wonder if in the original manuscript it tells you how to do yeah, it. Yeah, stuff like that. Because th- there was, because there was also um, the uh, the editor also didn't want to incite panic. He was one of those. Yeah. So he also cut things out that he thought would incite panic. Um, but what's really interesting, just to wrap up Beyond Lanios, it's a very, very short book. I read it in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> it was very, very short for being $15. Um, is, is she talks about now we know on Hellier, the, this book came out before Hellier, but on Hellier, she says that Indra Cold had passed away. But before. Uh, that in this book she talks about that Carl Ardo and uh, Demo and, and Indrid and his kids and all of them are on Facebook and they have accounts for those that are in the know and that they are on social media and she talks about how Indrid had become old and his kid or was a now a father that had three kids and was in charge of, of the yeah. going out and doing it was just very very interesting uh, for her to share uh, where they all like MTV or VH1s? Yeah. Where are they now? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, the little thought bubbles are popping. Bloop, bloop. Yeah, bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> pop up video, man. Um, but yeah, it was very, very interesting. And and yeah, so Hellier just it just opened that floodgate to John Keel to really in in, in in you know in Hellier definitely. Um, I would say that after watching Hellier, we were both really passionate about the documentary. Mm-hmm. We wanted to get involved somehow. You know, it really inspired us to want to learn more, to seek more information. I mean, Greg and Dane, I'm sorry how many times we reached out to you. Sorry you didn't respond back, but man, yeah. <laughs> we reached out to you. Um, but yeah, we were so passionate, which we've seen. So is everybody else that watches it. Right. It, it, it is very telling 
about how they approach this documentary so differently than most paranormal docs. Yep. And um, one of the things that uh, that actually came out of it, like you say, is our interest in Keel. Uh, and also, um, the overall, uh, you know, we, our own theories now involve uh, cave-dwelling UTs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and, uh, yeah, I will say, um, post Hellier now, post the first review, things have changed for me. I definitely feel like they were off topic when it came to the pan. I think that was a road yeah, that uh, yeah. was, and this is coming from a pagan, um, I think that went off in the wrong direction. I, I think, uh, Carl, right, is the, um, Carl's the filmmaker. So what's the other guy's name? Um, I don't know. You know who I'm talking about, though. Yes. With the guy that figured out all the numbers. Yes. Him heading towards that route is where I think it should have yeah. been. And it's interesting because I spoke to Brad. He watched Hellier. He didn't really like it because of the whole numbers stuff. He's like, that's when he thought it got stupid. But that's actually when I thought it got interesting. Yeah. And then reading Alan Greenfield's book yeah. and how good Lord has that opened up more doors, which we'll get to, you know, in, in not to get too far off topic, but the, even now thinking back to the original emails that sparked Hellier, the David Christie email, I'm really curious if that was a telling of events or if that was meant to trigger, like if that was meant to trigger some activity. Sure. What? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, (laughs) Almost like a um, a secret word that triggers your brain, you know, right. like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, who and, knows? And I've, you know, you know, and, and, and today even I speculated with you that that Hellier was a call for initiates. Yeah, well, well, especially if you talk to Greenfield for sure. Um, but it's like, yeah, it, because really, at the end of the day, the whole purpose of Hellier is only like one percent of where it went. Yeah. Like, yeah, they were trying. Uh, the first season really cr- tried to dwell on that, but that's not what it was all about. No, and especially Terry Wrist and and all of the things that happened post that, which are the things that are happening to us. Right, right. It, yep. It's like those are the things that are happening to us, um, including um, one of the things we got from Hellier that I will say we would not have gotten without Hellier was the Estes sessions yeah that we have done on our own which you know it, the whole premise behind the estes method is really just to cut off your other senses yeah it's it's actually like a combination of two things so it's a combination of using a ghost box or a radio hack um where it's just scanning through the radio yep. stations and most ghost hunters do this um but it's also cutting off all of your senses and just trusting what's in your brain yep. um, a lot of psychics will do this um, for people to show them, hey, I can't hear or see you because you're getting noise canceling headphones yep. and you're getting blindfolded. So all you have is essentially your smell, your taste, your touch, and your thoughts. Yeah, and that's what this does. But it combines the two. So instead of just noise cancellation headphones, you're also being fed uh, a ghost box. Right. And we, <laughs> from we, the yeah. get go, have had interest, and we were like, "Whoa, we're by Waverly Hills. Yeah. Let's go up to Waverly Hills," right. which, of course, was right at the start of the pandemic, so we couldn't get up there. No, but, but we, we got, parked right in front of the gate. Got to the gate, <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, we had some really interesting. I, I would say really interesting ghost related. Uh, contact mm-hmm. on the Estes on the on those on those sessions at least at, at that location, um, and, but really my takeaway uh, from that night more than the Estes sessions was Capella. Capella, I was going to say that too was our first uh, combined UFO sighting. Yeah, which you know we know was we know that it was at the same spot as Capella the mm-hmm. Star. But man, it was all over the place, and you you had that video of yeah. it of it, you know, just all of a sudden darting to the right, and I mean, a star wouldn't do that, mm-hmm. um, so it had to have been something trying to 
communicate with us. With and, us, right. yeah, because it, it blinked, it moved, it shifted, and it we were both zigzag. And there was it was no other stars doing that. No. So if it was a trick of the eye, why weren't other stars doing that right. or similar colored or similar sized? Well, and we both saw it at like the same yeah. time. Yeah. I was like, dude, do you see that? And then you looked, and then we just stood there and watched it forever. And right, and we looked it up that it was uh, where the location was was the star Capella. But then, as we started doing more research, we found stories of people who say that uh, ETs will tend to park in front of a star, right? Um, because they know the mathematical distance, so that it looks like from Earth as if it is the star, right? right. It's in a way a kind of cloaking. Right. And I think that's hiding in plain sight. Yeah. Hiding in plain sight. And I think that that's what it was that first night. But then those Estes sessions that we had were crazy, too. Yeah. I mean, from a ghost perspective, we we were definitely picking up on a lot of activity that was there. Oh, yeah. Especially from Waverly. We had, you know, the maintenance person. Right. um, You know, or 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 whatever. Whatever. (laughs) (laughs) It's been so long now, it's hard to remember. Some of those sessions are on YouTube, though, in case anybody is listening to it. Yes, please do check that out. Yeah, the ones we had in the car where we did try to speak to the uh, ET, um, we were trying to say, hey. Right. Can you squeeze in? And I believe at one point you shifted into that ET on yours and then shifted into my grandmother, <laughs> if you'll recall. Yeah, because yeah, um, you had a pretty emotional... Uh, yeah, yeah. My grandmother definitely, definitely showed up. But from that point on, I mean, it's like we, we kind of got addicted to doing Estes sessions. Oh, yeah. Well, I think every time we've gotten together, aside from getting together to record for the right. show, we've we've done a session. Yeah, and we've we've now not every single Estes session, especially when we've done like twenty back to back, like we did yeah. that one night. Um, yeah, they're not always great. No, but man, there's been some, and and I know you guys are gonna say bull hockey, but I swear to God, the best ones we've ever had were the ones we were like, eh, it hasn't been happening lately. Let's not it's record not it. Court. Yeah, <laughs> like like the the nights that we saw the UFOs. So. Yeah, UFOs. Yeah. people. <laughs> so which that's. Further in the timeline, so yeah. so let's let's jump back to a little bit of the timeline. So, after we saw Capella, you had your crazy Indrid cold drink oh, in the park. Yeah. So I, so when you, so it was precursored by a feeling to just go in the park. So yeah, that's right. You were out driving, right? Yeah, I'm out driving around because uh, quarantine had just kind of started. Um, so work was, you know, most people weren't going to work. Our classes got cut, things like that. So I was, I was just out of my mind. So I would just go drive around and, um, I live over by, uh, Waverly Park, which is in an old section of the Waverly Hills yep. property. It's not Waverly Hills property anymore, but it used to be. And, uh, anyways, I go up there and I just feel this urge. I mean, it's like 10 o'clock, 10, 11 o'clock at night. It's spooky as hell. I'm like, all right, let's go. <laughs> so I get up there and I mean, second I turn in, my heater blows. It's cold. I can't, I mean, I'm freezing. I'm trying to get up there. I see like entities cross. I'm thinking I'm seeing like entities or apparitions crossing the the road. road, At one point I saw what looked like a patient standing on a hill, um, in a white gown that creeped me out and all that stuff. Um, and I go all the way down and, uh, I stop at like this, this playground that's there and all this jazz and I'm just freaked out. And so I, I leave. Well, the headlights follow you out. Oh yeah. And so I have these headlights that follow me but there was no one there yeah like there was no one that could have followed me because i went all the way down there was no car and it's a dead end so yeah. there's only one way in and one way out right and i went all the way to the end and turned around and at some point there were headlights behind me and as i get to the end like the last turn his headlights disappear and yeah. there was nothing there yeah, so I mean, I think you went back in to try to find. Yeah, I went. They, I know. went back in real quick. Didn't see anything and got super spooked out. And the first place I could turn around, I turned back around. And the second I left the park and back onto Arnoldtown Road, my heat kicked back on. And that night, I because I, I told you guys what I told you in Santos, I was like, yeah. "Oh my god, this happened!" Right. Um, and then that night, I have this crazy dream that, um, and you know, it's on one of our episodes, but it's like a go down there. And I'm in the playground and there's like the swings are swinging on their own and it's like I'm freaked out. And then I see it was 
the Mothman. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I'm sitting uh, on those swings, and the Mothman comes down and removes uh, like his his face mask. It turns out to be Indra Cold, the big smile, the whole nine yards. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but who are you really, or something along those lines? And then his face phases into your face, Josh. And it becomes you that you were like, I'm in cold or something. I can't remember because I don't have a memory like you. But, yeah, it was a, a spooky, cool yeah. dream. It was scary and cool at the same time. But it's interesting how looking back, how much that has fed the theories that I have or matched up with the, the things theory, that I've yeah. read. You know, that we that it is all one. Yeah. Really, if you take a look at it. Yeah. So. And, and around that same time, I also had some dreams with Ingrid Cold, where I was. That that's that's the period of time when I was really, like our like our UFO story uh, this week. Uh, I was putting it into the cosmos to say, mm-hmm. if you want to connect with me, oh, connect yeah, with me. I forgot about that. Uh, and so several nights I was doing that, and several nights I was having some crazy dreams or 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 experiences or whatever you want to call them. Um, but one of those nights was actually involved Indrid Cold. Um, and I, I, I remember I was like standing, our, our, our faces were talking to each other, like talking heads mm-hmm. almost. Um, and I, and I asked him like, oh, what are, you know, what is my purpose? And, and, and he was like, uh, um, just continue on your path and you'll figure it out. And then I said, well, what's up with the grays? And he was like, <clears throat> um, uh, we needed a way to interface with you all, so we created them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so much more is coming out about Injured Cold. Um, you know, in uh, Tanya's book, she talks about this possibility that Valiant Thor, who is another famous humanoid alien yep. uh, that actually spoke to the Pentagon and all sorts of stuff, which I can't wait to cover Valiant Thor. Um, but it was around that same time he came out. Uh, she theorized that uh, Valiant Thor was like the supreme captain of their fleet. But then the, either the editor or Greenfield, I don't remember which one. I think it was I think it was Greenfield stated that they believe that Injured Cold and Valiant Thor may have been one and the same. One of the same. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's just nuts, though, man, in a in a very, very cool way. But, yeah, so we were inundated with dreams yeah. about Injured Cold. And now, you know, granted, we were reading Keel's books. Right. You know, we had already we were, moved on to uh, John Keel, uh, I, mean, we were, or, I mean, to the Eighth Tower. Right. I mean, we were saturated uh, in the content, if you will. Because it, it, it fit every missing piece that I had in my brain. Right. He had the puzzle piece. Right. And not just Mothman prophecies, but moving right into Eighth Tower and already looking into Operation Trojan Horse. I mean, just Keel, it's almost as if I was him in a past life is what it felt like. Yeah. Like like that, because all those thoughts, the way he speaks, the way he yep. thinks, it fits me. Yeah. And I'm like, good Lord, man. It's like, I wish you were still alive. Yeah. I would love to just haven't pick your brain for an hour 15 minutes yeah. even like just yeah, yeah. um and, and it's a long it's around the same time that, that we're having all these dreams i guess it's it's my my uh my rant or not rant my stream of consciousness mm-hmm. i forgot about that so that's when um like i had reached out into the cosmos for some uh you know connection this is after watching hellier but I think this is so. This is definitely before your Indra dream because mm-hmm. this is where the whole stream of uh, Mothman was on a cryptid comes from. Right. It was like you know I got up to get ready for work and uh, in the shower and then on the way to work it's just like all this flood of information, ideas, and and whatever was was flowing. And at one point in time, I videoed it in the car on the way to work. That's up on YouTube if anybody. That's why I'm sad it. you've been working from home so much. Because we haven't gotten any videos. <laughs> I know it, it, it does seem like the the time that I would be driving to and from work it seems like that would be the most time that I would have these kind of um, uh, you know thought explosions, if you will. Well, and, and to to bring up the pandemic, I hate that it's happening, but it has also aided us because. It has given us the time because I'm not teaching improv classes. I'm not doing shows. I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. I, I'm literally 
working or was off work for yeah. a month and a half and being with my wife and doing this podcast. That's it. That's all I'm doing. And the rest of the time has been filled with research and, and docs and books. Yeah. Whereas before the pandemic, there's no way. I mean, I maybe had a half hour every night to kind of yeah. read something. And, and it did. It took me a minute to read Mothman Prophecies because I just didn't have time. Yeah. And now I've read Greenfield's book in like pff, three days, right? Yeah. So it's like <laughs> there's a part of me that hate you, know, of course, will always hate the pandemic. But I'm thankful for it at the same time for the time that it gave me and the ability to see what was important to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it also allowed us to find out that me moving to Phoenix is not going to be a problem. We can, no, right. Because we had to record from separate homes for right. quite a while. Exactly. <laughs> Zoom to the rescue. Yep. Um, but yeah, so uh, again, kind of jumping back over to our, um, to our, uh, timeline here. So, th- so after all of that kind of stuff, uh, happened, and so you, we had our dreams about Ingrid and, and, and then I, you know, I continue to have, um, some, some really weird dreams with like alien, uh, entities and a bunch of different types of alien entities visiting me at the house. And at the, at the time we had, we'd, we had decided we were going to try to adopt a dog and, and, uh, he had to get up and go outside every morning at six o'clock in the morning. So, uh, one night I had had a dream that, uh, aliens flew from the forest area behind mm-hmm. my house, over my house, landed in the field across the street from my house, got out, oh, yeah. started walking towards my driveway, uh, a big long line of like military people came and started shooting at the aliens and the aliens were shooting back. And then I like screamed out, no, like this. And they like turned and started shooting at me and I ran and hid in the tree line. Well, um, as, when I woke up from that, uh, from that dream to take my dog out, I'm standing in the backyard. There's no light. Um, my dog is fixated on something standing in the backyard. Mm-hmm. Like he's just staring at it. And I freak out. I mean, like, I have cold chills all over my body. And I say, I thought I was ready. I'm not. Yeah, I remember <laughs> Like that. I verbally said, I thought I was ready. <laughs> I'm not. I'll let you know. Like and, a freshman with a, a woman who's <laughs> been through it before. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and like, it was funny because after I said that, dog just went on. Like, it was not, like there was nothing there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it, and, and, and then really... Um, as the, uh, as the pandemic has continued and as lockdown has continued, um, and as work has continued, cause work has been really stressful over the last several, uh, months. Um, a lot of that stuff has really dropped off for me. I've, I've, I've still been doing the research and reading the books and watching the shows and all that kind of stuff. And I still have some ideas and comments and, and theories, but like, I haven't really been able to reconnect well, lockdown or not, you still had a huge work project that yeah. consumed yeah. you. Even if I was going into the office every day, it still probably would have distracted me from being able to engage that way. Yeah. Um, and so what's interesting is, is legit COVID lockdown starts at this point. Like at that point, it was like, please stay inside, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Then it was like, do not go anywhere. Right. But somehow we convinced our wives <laughs> <laughs> to let us do um, a thing. And that's when we went out to Waverly Park. I was like, we had wanted to do it anyways. We right. wanted to go out there. We wanted to do an Estes session out there. Right. Um, and so somehow we were able to convince our wives to let us. It was kind of the last time for a while. Yeah. Um, but we went out there, and that's where I unintentionally channeled yeah. uh, during Something. Estes message and method. And we do. We have this on uh, on audio. We do, but it's it's really hard to listen to because right. this was the time when we thought, what if we do a double Estes? Uh, yeah, what if we do double Estes to see if we talk to do each other? Do we talk to each other? <laughs> <laughs> which, which, was, which was chaos, which yeah. was chaos, but it was really interesting. I, I almost feel like listening to it, that it was like, it was really the opposite. It was, I was talking to two entities that were talking to each other and you were talking to two entities that were talking to each other, but we weren't really talking to each other. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because it it really feels like in going back and trying to, to single out your conversation, the, it would, it would be like there would be an entity that would ask a question or say a statement. And then you would like channel some voice that would, that would give a response. Yeah. And it's interesting because um, something that came up was Mel Keith 
Yeah. And, um, you know, of course we looked it up. We can't find any star or anything like that. And then I, I'm just now sitting here thinking, I'm like, why were we looking up? Why would we assume it would have an Earth name attached yeah. to it? You know, like when the star to us could just be A27.3. Right. Right. But to them, it's called Mount Keith. Well, and, and it, and it really, um, I, I, I got the sent and I'm trying to remember the, actually listening to the, to the audio from it, but it was very much a, I'm going to rule you type yeah, situation. It was, it, 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 it was listening to it myself too. It scared me because it was two entities and it felt like one light, which was a representation of myself and then one that was dark. Yeah. And, and it would speak in the middle of the other one's sentence. Like yeah. it was, it was just very odd. And it, and it's come back once in another Estes set, another Estes the session. The one from a few weeks ago when we didn't record. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we saw it, our, saw our UFOs. Um, it, 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 it came up there a couple times. But to flip it back, that night, not only did that happen, but that's when I just decided to look through the sunroof and, yes. and I saw a damn UFO. UFO. And I'm like, Josh, do you see that? And you were like, yes. And, and so we, we get out of the car. And we see 11 more. <laughs> yeah, we see 11 more. We watch it disappear above us. And so we check the timing because at the same time coming from the cross direction was the uh, space station. Space station yeah. So we saw the ISS go by. So we were able to reference the yep. exact time with because we're like, oh, Starlink is, is there. Everybody's like, oh, it's probably Starlink. It was it not. not Starlink. It was in a similar direction. But it was but it was too high in the sky. It was too a too high in the sky. And B, it was like 10 minutes later yeah. than when it was supposed to be done. And it disappeared at the top of the horizon, right. like or at the top of the sky. It did not complete. It disappeared right. as if a ship was going inside some sort of cloaked mothership. Well, and, and what's really interesting is I have seen, um, I have seen Starlink uh, since, mm-hmm. and it I can track it all the way across the sky. Like it doesn't yeah. disappear unless it goes behind the yeah, cloud. Just or I, I looked at Starlink while we were in Michigan. I showed my nephew yeah. and we watched. We only saw two because I think we caught the tail end of it. But yeah, we watched it track across I mean, the entire sky. This was not that. And then not only that, so we saw eleven. So ten of them were in that direction. There's nine or nine. nine there. That's right. And then and two more. This two more, but came at a different direction and like at a different angle. Yeah, at a different angle. Came from the similar area, right? But at a completely different angle. Starlink does not come at different angles, yeah. and um, the theory that we came up with was this idea that they are using satellites. They are using Starlink. To cloak themselves, much like they did with Capella, Again, to follow hide, behind, hiding in plain hiding sight. in plain sight. Yeah, wouldn't you follow this train that they they know people are going to see in the sky as just a light? They can follow behind it because who's going? I mean, yes, there are nerds out there that go. Um, there are only exactly nine cars on the Starlink train, uh, and uh, 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 you know, I mean, you yeah. know, nobody really knows, so it's not like. Yeah, it's just it's fascinating to me, and and, uh, and those same nerds, by the way, that would say that they would probably say that it's not really a train because it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you obviously haven't seen Space Train Yamato or whatever that <laughs> that anime is, uh, but yeah, that was that was intense um, because the the Capella one, we still were, we still felt like we could, like we could talk it off. Yeah, but it was like that one. I mean, we both saw it plain as day. We both saw them disappear. We saw the other two come from a different direction. We saw the International Space Station so that we could coordinate and yep. check times for exact moments. And we we had this proof. And, and for days, I think we were both dumbfounded. Uh, and I know we still even tried to dispute it, right. uh, which is I mean, what we, we do. I mean, we tried to argue against ourselves, right? Yeah. We tried to look up a reason or what it could be. And, and frankly, we weren't able to find anything. So yeah. it was not identified. Therefore, it was a unidentified flying object. Yep. It was some uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon. A UAP. So I've just made up. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, you made it up. <laughs> um, but I know that that started. Yeah. So <laughs> that started. Do, do, don't mind the pun here, but a train yeah. of UFO sightings and, and, for the both of us. And each one getting more and more. Uh, intense, if intense. That's the right yeah, word. Yeah, that's exactly the word I was thinking of. Um, so, did I push it into your brain? I don't know. Um, so <laughs> yeah, the, maybe. so the, uh, you know, fast forward, I guess, a few weeks. 
Um, again, somehow we had convinced our wives for us to be able to have a bonfire. Yeah, we decided, uh, yeah, because we were going to social distance, which right. we did. And we did two Fearscape Unhinged episodes. Yep. Outside by a bonfire. Yep. Uh, roast some hot dogs. Yeah, oh. roasted weenies. <laughs> um, but uh, but did did that out by the fire, and um, that night we had again some great Estes sessions. Mm-hmm. We did some outside. We did some inside. Um, uh, we also I think saw several UFOs that night. Yeah, I, at least three that I can. Well, I know for a fact I saw three. Um, the very very first one that we saw. Um, was blinking when I would shoot my laser pointer. No, that was later. Oh, that was later. This was that was what you're talking about is just a few weeks ago. I'm talking about the first bonfire. Oh, we Lord, saw it's all coming together. <laughs> you're gonna have to remind me. No, yeah. So the first. Oh, that's the night the moon was out, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I do. I did merge those two together. Yep. Um, and then also might have been the same night that the cloud stuttered. Yes, that that's the night that the cloud started is when the moon was out. Yeah. I do remember that because it was a bright. So we were like, man, we finally got out here and the moon's it's super bright. bright. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we saw that one uh, above the tree um, that went up that way. Yep. Uh, I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and we also looked for Capella again because it was out that night. Yeah. And it, and it didn't behave the way that it had no, behaved it did before. Not. It did not. So again, it's it's more like it was. It had served its purpose. Mm-hmm. It had gotten our attention. Um, and, you know, in, in between that time, we also interviewed Andrea Perron. Oh, my God, yes. I'm so caught up in the UFO stuff that I forgot about the UFO stuff. So, so here's Andrea Perrin, who we think is going to be a paranormal uh, ghost. ghost thing because of, you know, her story was made popular in the Conjuring movie. Right. Um, her and her family. And so it turns out to barely talk about yeah. that. In fact, she wrote a book about ETs. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, and then a lot of the stuff that's, that she is saying in our interview is just syncing up with everything that we've been thinking at the time. Everything. Um, it just, it, it, it was like, it was like, um, it was like a plugged drain that yeah. she just pulled the plug on. Right. Like all of a sudden, I was ju- it just took me to where I needed to go. Yeah. And so one of the things that she said when she was on is that they make themselves known to you to let you, you know, like to, to, mm-hmm. because you're ready to see them. Because you're ready to see them. She told us about they love when you sing to them. Right. So we sang yeah. to them, um, all sorts of stuff. And she's become a great friend. Yeah. And it sucks because we were supposed to meet her, but the pandemic right. caused right. Uh, the shows where she was going to be at to be canceled. Um, but yeah, and it was just like her like coming on and then talking to Santiago. And it was just like all these guests that we had were all kind of on this. They were yeah. on this, which is so weird because it's right. like every guest we had, because Keith got them for us, we're all paranormal uh, right. ghost hunters, yet it always led to this this UT or ET yeah. conversation. Right. And and it's it's really um, – so I, I'm going to say I, I myself have recently been looking into numerology mm-hmm. and how it can help tell you things about your life mm-hmm. and all of that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I found about myself uh, based on the, the numerology – uh, uh, application, if you will, is that um, I am the type of personality that I will immediately uh, synchronize with whoever I'm speaking with, mm-hmm. uh, and they will, for some, you know, for whatever reason, find themselves just immediately my friend. Yeah, and that's what it really feels like. Every guest that we've had on the show. Uh, has immediately been our friend. Oh yeah, I mean Andrea is the first perfect example of yeah. that. Keith, <laughs> Keith Age now has been on our show what three, four times. That's right. I mean, and he has been, uh, he has been our paranormal papa. I mean, he has been so amazing to us, and we've become such good friends with him. And he's hooked us up with so many great people. We were able to get Andrea. We became Santiago, so great man right. in his high yaw movement, and then talking to Mary Dees Hampton right. and just all these people. You know, Tori Smith with the paranormal. Yes, help Tori, desk. and even Santosh, Todd Bonner, Todd Bonner, Joe all these, Perdue. I mean, just all these just connections, right. and then how like. Like, even talking to Joe, like, the synchronicities there, that he's friends with a friend that I'm friends with that I met in Seattle. Yeah. Like, (laughs) you know, like, just, it's just insane. And, yeah, every person we've talked to 
has been an intense connection. I mean, even Mary Dees Hampton. I mean, here's a person who I thought had done a million podcasts. We were her first. Right. And and we connected with her so quickly. Quickly. Yep. And, and it's just, it's been that way for everybody. Vashti Hooper. Oh, Vashti. Oh, I love you. I haven't even talked about you yet. Good Lord. But, I, I mean, that was just amazing. That whole interview was, I mean, every, I'll say it this way. Every uh, interview that we've done has been uh, probably entertaining for our listeners, Mm -hmm. but it has been, uh, it has furthered our personal growth. Yes, it has been very insightful and mind blowing for us and has led to other avenues yep. like of research and thoughts and and theories continuation and hypotheses. just like, just a just a yeah just a continuation of, of the of the the path the journey so because i know we're, we're we're running a little long here so mm-hmm. i um but i wanted so the stuff at work got crazy um you had a couple things going on we still of course we're recording the show mm-hmm. but nothing really like it seems like a lot of activity really dropped off as it pertains to this stuff right right then we had another i won't call it a bonfire because it was like four logs but we had another fire <laughs> out in the backyard yes i um, totally snatched a log from your neighbor they don't yeah know. yeah they don't know <laughs> <laughs> but um in that night was when you had the laser pointer and that night was a two of the most profound <laughs> profound estes methods yes. that we've ever had um, which we didn't record, um, which we decided that night that we were recording every single every one single, from here on yes. out. And we needed to write down every experience yeah. we have because that night we also had two of the most profound UFO sightings. Yeah. Um, whereas I had three and you may have had three as well. Cause I had one while you were under the Estes session. But yeah, I mean, it's like I had the my laser pointer, and I had it that first night, but it wasn't really doing anything. No. But that night we see something moving, and so I'm like, like so something. So just to kind of uh, for those who maybe can visualize, uh, in the uh, sky about maybe 25 to 30 degrees above the horizon, uh, moving from um, south to north, mm-hmm. because that's the situation of my the way my property is situated. So from south to north. About twenty or twenty-five or thirty degrees above the horizon is this light uh, that's that's really bright, mm-hmm. and and it's for those who might be thinking, you know, it's the nighttime, it's a bright light, it's clearly an airplane headlight. No, because mm-hmm. airplane headlights are bright when you're looking at them. Yeah. But this was moving horizontally from our perspective. It was moving horizontally. Um, it was not a lightning bug. As we were able to see it consistently. And it was also white. Most lightning bugs are or green. Or green. Yeah. So I have my big giant <laughs> laser pointer that I got from Wish.com for a dollar. <laughs> and this thing can hit uh, Jupiter's storm. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, this thing's high powered. It can hit the bottom of the clouds, everything. So I'm like, we, we, we were very, very certain it was not a plane. Yep. So I flashed at it. I blinked it twice. It blinked twice. It blinked back. And I was like, wait, what? But it was still moving across the horizon. Still moving across the horizon. But it blinked back. It blinked back. Every time you would hit it with the pointer, it would respond. And I did it at random intervals on purpose. Yeah. I did it at random intervals. And trust me when I say my hand is shaky. I was not hitting this thing directly no. as if it was a satellite and just reflecting back to me no. what I did. It was It was definitely, I mean, you were all over the place. Yeah, it was all over the place. <laughs> And, it, and there's no way that small little laser pointer would would have a brighter – because, I mean, it blinked big. Right. And, and like if it, I would blink three times, it would blink three times. I mean, it, would, it imagine, if you will, um, having a uh, – shining just like a handheld flashlight. Uh, and then when, it, when you responded, it, it became a spotlight. Yeah. I mean, it was that big. It was that a, big. And it was just like any time we lost sight of it because it was, you know, not very, very bright when it wasn't blinking. I just had to blink in the general direction and it would blink and we'd right, find it. Right. We knew right where it was. To me, it, it, to me, it almost felt like um, um, a lighthouse. Yeah. Like it would go dark and it would almost like circle around and it would get bright and then it would go dark and it would, but there was, but it wasn't a, like a, a, a timed interval. Yeah, there like was this. no, there was, it was random and it would only happen when I did it. And that's what made it so remarkable was that we were able to test interact. It. Yeah, we were interacting and testing it. 
Yeah. And even like after it went behind the trees in the house and we didn't really kind of know, yep. I flashed again over in that direction. And right. by golly, that's where it was. Yeah. I mean, it, we, we saw, we tracked it until it was, you know, behind. Right. And we did research. We checked um, satellite positions and things like that. Yep. There was nothing. nothing. Because um, we've got everything. We've got star tr- satellite yeah. trackers, star trackers. We've got it all because <laughs> we want to double check. But, I mean, yeah, there was there was nothing in the sky that night. And, and honestly, this was not – I've seen the lights that are really high that could be disputed as satellites. This right. was not that. This was no. more uh, – probably closer to, like, maybe – Five or ten thousand feet elevation. Yeah, I mean and, it was not. At and like I said, well. I did I did the research, check the dates and the times, and there was nothing in that area um, that fit. That there yeah. was nothing. There was literally nothing that moved. Yeah, there was no satellites that crossed that path and those in that area. I mean, it was just. So so then we did after we saw that we decided to do a couple of uh, as the sessions, um, the one that uh, that that you were under for. Um, the the theme, if you will, was Son of Zeus. It Son of Zeus, yeah, and um, that I also accidentally channeled again during yeah, that. Yeah, you did. And then the one that came up when I was doing it, I don't remember, but I remember you saying something, uh, are you here? And then it was like saying it was behind you, and then you heard a rustle in the... <laughs> yeah, I heard a rustle in the woods, and then I was like, show me, and you were like, north, or something like that, and I look in that direction, and I see another UFO. Yeah. Or a satellite, or I don't know. But whatever. But it showed yeah. you told me where to look, and I saw it, and it moved, and I watched it <laughs> until it <laughs> disappeared, like it did right. uh, with the the uh, the ones we saw at Waverly Hills. Um, it it just all after it saw it, it just blinked out. It was yeah. gone. Well, and, and then um, at one point in time when you were doing yours. I you you said um, you said airplane and I said is there an airplane coming and then you said yes and then I said well I don't see anything and you, and you said wait for it and then like twenty seconds later an airplane flew by. <laughs> it was crazy, yeah. man. So the, again, some of the most profound Estes sessions. Then then the big one. the big one. So like we were just kind of standing there, still kind of watching the sky where we had seen the others. Uh, I don't remember which one of us turned. It was me because okay. we were sitting there. And my neck was hurting, so I leaned my head back, and I look behind us over to the left, and I see a big bright light, which I think is an airplane. And but I'm I mean, like, it was it was low. In it the was sky. way too low, and I was like, "Shut up!" And there was no noise. And where that was would have been if that was a helicopter or an airplane, just at that point would have made a noise. Yeah. I mean, helicopters do. So I'm I'm like a mile from the river. And helicopters do fly by, and I hear them. But that's the thing. With a helicopter and an airplane, at least where I am in my experience, because I do hear them, is you hear them before you see them. Especially as low as this was. And then you turn around and look, and then it just lights up. It just lights up, and then it just, like, shoots away. Yeah. And then it was gone. (laughs) It was gone. I mean, it got so yeah. I mean, oh, I want to cuss so bad right now because I want to <laughs> say it got so freaking bright. Yeah. Like, like, like a softball bright as like, that's how big right. it was in the sky. I mean, sky. It probably like a, a quarter of the moon bright in yes. the sky. Yes. Um, to where it was, you know, just maybe a, a fifth of, or I mean, a tenth or fifteenth of the moon yeah. before that we're just watching it and then it just expands into this bright light and then starts to shrink and shoots off. It shoots off. Yep. <laughs> we were just like. And so, you know, and then, and then I've had the thought. After that night, that it was the same thing that we had tracked before coming back to investigate. Well, and you had said at one point, you were like, oh, I kept waiting for before that happened. You were like, oh, I kept thinking this thing was going to come back around. Yeah. And then, so maybe it did. Maybe it did. Maybe so, it did. but yeah, so, so I mean, in, um, you know, I'm having the dreams again. So, I mean, that, that pretty much catches us up to where we are today. Um, but as you can, as you can kind of tell, um, if you kind of track the intensity uh, of where we started to where we are now, every every time we are, I mean, so the dream, then the, the you know, then the helping them cross over, and then you know, then we start to see uh, some you know some UFOs that could be considered, you know, somebody could argue that it's a play of our eyes, or that somebody could argue that it's the um, the satellites. To, to now a UFO that is actually we've engaged with mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. and has and has like presented itself to us. And so July 11th is the next time that we're getting together for some for some cool stuff. And I am really looking forward to see what happens on that date. Well, let me let me tell you this so we can share our announcement now yep. because this is part of all that synchronicity. It's you know, we talked that a lot of this happened after we watched Hellier and we did our Hellier episode. Well, that was ages ago. I mean, that was like November, December, yeah, month, months ago, <laughs> you know, months ago, I was still living in Indiana yeah. and, um, like I, I, I just, I get done reading Alan Greenfield's book. I just finished it. And the very next day we get an email from Alan Greenfield yeah. <laughs> out of the blue, right? Who said that he discovered our podcast and loved the hell your episode and loved the podcast and that's all he wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. He was just like, just wanted to say, cool, cool, kachoo, and then answered some theory that we had talked about right. during no, Hellier. Well, it was, it was, uh, because we had talked about not being able to find his book and finding some really expensive copy on, oh, on yeah. eBay. And so he gave us the link to actually pick up the, the complete secret cipher. Right. Which out. is what yeah. we, we all have, including Santosh now. Yeah, and yeah. I've finished that as well. But I was like, we need to see if he wants to be on the show. Right. And immediately he said yes. Yeah. And we have been conversing with him for the past few weeks, which is why I'm sure he's been in my dreams. And then he's showing up in all these books I'm yeah. reading. Like he, I mean, like I said, his name is in Beyond Lanulos. Yeah. Like because it talks about him catching a picture of Demo. Like in the sixties, right? And, and just like, and then he, of course, is, and he talks about Keel. He knows Keel. Yeah. Or he knew Keel, excuse me. And it just, the synchronicity that here is this author who we have already started obsessing over. Right. Because this all led to my rejuvenation of the occult and finding out how it ties in with ufology and ultra terrestrials and now. Um, organizations like the Templars and the Freemasons yeah. and just seeing how this is. And I got a little something else I got to tell you about here in a second it, and all of that. And then having dream, I've dreamed about him like three times over the past two weeks. I'm seeing him everywhere, you know, and there's theories out there that he is, uh, you know, that he may be Terry wrist. And yeah. then there's others that say he might be injured cold. Uh, right. I <laughs> don't, I don't, I don't want to give him right. I, know I don't you agree don't. with either one of those. I know you don't, but Regardless, reading and the things that he was into, the OTO, Golden Dawn, and all those things, that's the type of magic that could make things possible. And, you know, there are, again, there are people that think he is the one that's pulling the strings of the Hellier yeah. uh, strands, uh, Tyler strands. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, we're going to have him on in two weeks. So not only are we meeting to hang out and, you know, look at the sky and stuff like that is we're meeting with him at night right um to record an episode or two yeah. with him which i am fascinated and just cannot wait so what i wanted to tell you about before you expand on that just a quick information i've started watching the new unsolved mysteries and uh it's really interesting because they do just a full episode on one thing well the very very first episode is a missing persons case Towards the very end of the episode, they dropped this three-minute thing that I was like, I need y'all to get in touch with Alan Greenfield because he'll solve this whole thing. They he they find this note that he wrote. Well, supposedly that he had wrote. Who he? The man that went missing. Okay. It was like hidden behind a toilet and it was all typed up and it had all these different names of like celebrities, but it was like laid out a certain way and went all this stuff. And then they said that they had found all these books on Freemasonry and all this stuff. And here I am reading this book where Greenfield's talking about the Freemasons and the secret cipher that they use that more yeah. than anybody in anything. And there was like this loose thing where somebody had joked that um, all this random chaos stuff was probably some sort of code. And then they moved on. <laughs> and I'm like, I literally just the day before finished this book where they were talking about the Freemasons using this cipher and using code to speak. And here it is right I have there a letter. on the Unsolved <laughs> Mysteries. They're saying it looks like just a bunch of chaos, but yet we found these Freemason books. I don't know. And yeah. I'm sitting there like, I'm going to call, but y'all are going to think I'm crazy. I'm going to be like, y'all need to contact Alan Greenfield, get on his secret cipher. He can figure this out for you and we'll find him. Or just, you know, maybe give us the letter. Or, or he's, or he died. I don't remember which, but yeah, like, but still, there's information right. in there. And it was just like, 
uh, again, the synchronicities. Right. Like, I, this is the first time I've ever heard about the Freemasons using a cipher and using a code that was similar to what Crowley was using and, and the Kabbalah and all of this stuff. And then here it is. Right. A quick three minute segment of this episode that just got washed. It was like the producer was like, I don't know. We need two more minutes. Can yeah. we throw in the Freemason <laughs> crap? And that was to me, I was like, we can figure this out. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyways, yeah. So we've got Greenfield coming on yep. and it's, it's, I'm just like, I want to, I want to, like, I'm judging everything now. Um, how he's, he spelled his name in, in earlier publications, how he has <laughs> like spaces in between things, how there's different fonts in his book, like <laughs> everything. I'm like, I oh, know it's a code, AG. <laughs> this. <laughs> This sentence has a mis has a, a misused word. You know, it must be a code. Well, and that's that's the <laughs> thing because Terry Wrist's stuff did too, and in Hellier, you know, the email that Terry sent and all that had these weird spacings and yeah. and things like that. Well, then here's his book, and it has those similar spacings, and then, like that's where that idea that they're one and the same. But to me, that just says they come from the same background, right? Or but they, or they, or maybe Ag has some bad publishers. <laughs> That's also true. Um, I don't know, but I, I feel like he's the type of guy that does it on purpose. Like that there yeah. is a meaning. Not all of it, cause there are some weird things where like a, where there's like text and then there's a picture and it's like over the picture. And I'm like, that was an accident. But yeah. you know, other things, like there are just some things that I've seen that seem very, very intentional. Hmm. So, or that's part of his mystique. He wants you to think that he, wants he, he, just, think he just wants right, extra right. spaces to be like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mess with these guys. <laughs> I don't know. Regardless, I'm so excited and scared and nervous. I've never been so nervous to talk to a guest before. Really? Just because I've, I've, I've just, I've, I just uh, like immersed myself in his book and that complete cipher just added the second half of that book just really fed more of that and um i've just i've kind of become a little bit of a fanboy and like mm -hmm. i'm trying to seek some of his other books just to just to keep i like his writing style well and alan if you if you happen to listen to this episode uh don't be afraid you know stefan's not gonna track you down or anything <laughs> <laughs> no no not yet no. <laughs> but yeah that and t that's what's funny that's why we said this is the journey and look where it's led to and I already know it doesn't matter. Every guest we've had has opened a door. And we're about to interview the guy that has created the lock to the door, right? Yeah. <laughs> or at least figured out the key to the, the key, lock. The key, the combination, yeah. right? It's like I, I'm just so pumped to see. That's why I thought I agreed with you. This was the perfect time to share where we are because I think after this, well, it's getting bigger. Well, we've got, you know, I don't. We've got coming up, so we've got the Alan Greenfield interview. Mm -hmm. Later in July, we're going to Point Pleasant. Oh, yeah, we are. Uh, you, me, and Santosh, yeah. we're going to Point Pleasant. We're going to meet so, up with Joe, and we're going to, like, look for UFOs. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's coming mm -hmm. over the next month. Um, and also in, the, in that numerology stuff, you know, I, I found out that uh, July is the best month for me. And any day that that is a duplicate number, so like the eleventh, mm -hmm. is a good is a good day for me. And so we're interviewing Alan on July eleventh. So right. and you then know. your birthday is April eleventh um, or August eleventh or August. Sorry, August eleventh. And then we have another guest next week. We've got um we we're gonna have uh, Wayne. Oh, I'm sorry, Wayne. I forgot your last name. But Wayne, he ha he's part of a Bigfoot investigations yep. up just across the bridge that Joe introduced us to. Right. We're gonna have him on next week next month. I mean, it's like, it's, we got some cool stuff coming up. Yep. And we, we have, thank you guys so much because we have seen our numbers double and triple in terms of, uh, like listeners. I mean, every day I check the numbers and they grow and it's just so thankful yep. and fascinating. Um, uh, we could not have done any of this without you guys. And yep. I'm just glad you give a shit about what we're saying because <laughs> our families don't. <laughs> <laughs> so. so, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think that that pretty much catches everybody up to where yeah. our journey is so far. Um, and I, and I'm sure, like I said, everything seems to, 
Uh, everything definitely seems to expand on the previous thing. And so it's kind of like, uh, I think it's, I think it's Moore's law when it talks about technology that every, I think it's every two years technology will double on itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really feel like with, with, with what we're going through. It's like every time it, it occurs, it's not just a step up. It's like almost a double up of what it was the last time. Yeah, for, for sure. I mean, even, <laughs> I mean, we didn't even mention this, but even the John Teeter episodes has opened our eyes to time and right. space and time travel where we weren't expecting to. Right. Um, just, yeah, I, even the research that we're finding is changing what we're deciding on researching. It's one of the reasons we don't release our schedule a lot ahead right. of time because a lot of times that changes. It shifts. Yeah. Based off of, we're like, oh crap, we need to we talk, need about, to talk this. about this. We need to talk about this, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I want to start wrapping up. I want to get out of here. I hate to, but I think we've ran the gamut on our timeline here. Um, but, uh, yeah, again, thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening. Um, I want to quickly get to our listener story uh, and get this out of the way just because it's a good one and I don't want to lose it. Uh, but this one comes from uh, a woman named Heather uh, from Kentucky. Um, and this is... Listener story is portrayed by another good friend of mine. Her name is Kate Kane Buley. She is the bomb diggity. Uh, she is a good friend and improviser. Um, but this story is, is kind of an interesting one. So let's go ahead and check that one out. Hey, Stefan. Hey, Josh. I'm Heather. I'm from Kentucky. And I want to tell you a, a true story that still gives me a weird feeling when I think about it. When my husband was 19, he lived in an old plantation house on Tuckahoe Road in Mason County, Kentucky. There was a well in front of the house and about, uh, about a half a mile behind the house was the family cemetery. And I remember my first day there, it was so hot. It was so hot that day. And he was showing me around the inside of the house. I mean, it was a plantation. It was really cool, and uh, there was a lot to see. But, again, it was it was hot outside. But inside, it was really cold, which I thought was strange. So we went down in the coal cellar, and there uh, were chains hanging on the wall where they once kept their slaves. The plantation used to be active, so they had slaves, and when they got in trouble, they'd bring them in here, and I guess they used those chains. Um, anyways, then this is where the crazy started. After we left the cellar, he went to show me the cemetery. Um, if you could imagine, like a hot, dry day, no wind blowing. As we walked closer to the cemetery, though, the wind began to pick up, and it started to cool off. By the time we got there, the wind had picked up so much, and I swear I could hear those chains just rattling off in the distance. There was a headstone that said children had fallen in the well, and that was placed there to memorialize them. So between the chains and the headstone and the wind blowing so much, we decided uh, we, just, we just left. Each time I went out there, something strange would happen. I've always thought it was just me until I ran into other people that lived in the house that had stories of their own. I guess a few years back, they tore down that house and built a new one. To this day, when we go riding the back roads, I think about that house, and it still gives me chills when driving by the property. So yeah, thank so, you, yeah. Heather, for sending that in to us. Um, and to to be whew. to be way out in the field and it's still hear the chains rattling back at the house. I know. Well, and they shouldn't have been rattling. There was no windows down right. there. That like that was well, I mean, the whole it, thing. It was a cellar, so it could have like my, so. My grandparents' house is built. That they grew that I you know, grew up in was in 1825, right? And its cellar had like the big you know pull double pull open doors, right, right? You know it was like it didn't have it's not like a basement in the house. Yeah, we yeah, had, it's a coal cellar, right? And so um, you know, yes, it didn't have windows, but it but it also could have been draft. I mean, it was drafty, sure, because she didn't say where she entered the basement at. No, I mean, it could have been like Dorothy, right? And, and if it's an older house, if it's like a plantation type house, but it, still, but still, I mean, even she said so, it was like a quarter of a mile away. Right. Which I mean, where it, the it would was. it would have to be like really drafty to bang those chains around on the on the bricks in order to make enough sound for her to hear it. Right. But away. I mean you you talk about some classic paranormal stuff happening is that she it's a super hot day. She enters the house and it's freezing. 
Yeah. You know, it's not like, yes, those old houses were built to move air better because they didn't have air conditioning, right. but not to that point where it's freezing. Yeah. And then she gets out there, she gets freezing again, and they see that memorial to the kids with yeah. the, the, that it perished the, in the, the well, well, and yeah. just that wind. I mean, it was enough to scare her away from there. And then to meet someone else that lived there was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> and she still gets chills when she drives right. by the just the area. Right. Well, because they, they built that other house on top. Yeah, on top. So, so I mean, it's just whoever whoever decided to live in that house, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, but, again, thank you, Heather, for sending that in to us. Please, please, please. Uh, we have been getting s- some more via email, and we're so thankful for that. Uh, send your listener stories in to uh, fearscapepodcast at gmail.com. Or even on our website, they can do that, right? Yep. So on our website now, there's a report, a sighting mm-hmm. um, form, and you can. It doesn't have to be, you know, you, it could be UFO, it could be cryptid, it could be ghost, whatever. You just kind of fill it out, uh, fill in your, you know, whatever you can remember, whatever you want to provide. And there's even a box for you to say if you want to remain anonymous. Yes. Yeah. And you can put on there, say, hey, I would like to send this in as a listener story. Um, if you're, you know, really want to make sure we see it as such to let us know, hey, this isn't a recent report. Maybe this something happened to you when you were a kid. Yeah. It's just another platform for you to share your listener stories. Or like we said, to we're trying to collect sightings of paranormal things, UFOs, cryptids, ghosts, all of the above. Uh, we want to collect those. You can get onto our new social scape there yeah. and interact with other people that are on there on message boards. Create a message board. Our website is really taking off, and we're very, yeah. very excited about it. And, of course, you guys know you can get T-shirts on there and all the good links yeah. to the social media and all that stuff. All that's at fearscapepodcast.com. Make sure to check it out. Um, but, Josh, unless there's anything else. Not right now, but I'm looking forward to the next six months. Who oh, knows? me too, man. I am too. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening to Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. We love you guys so much. This has been Stefan, and I will catch you on the flip side. This has been Josh. The truth is out there. And remember, folks, hold those blankets extra tight because things tend to get spooky when you listen to Fearscape. Good night, everybody. Good night. I'm so glad you were able to join us for that horrifying discussion. I hope they didn't frighten you too much. (laughs) Tune in next week for even more research into the nightmarish and haunting creeps and spooks that we tell ourselves don't exist, but we know they do. Make sure you have your blankets that you hold them extra tight. Next time on Fearscape. <laughs>Hey, Blanket Huggers, Stefan here from Fearscape Paranormal Podcast, and do we have a scary good deal for you right now. If you head over to fearscapepodcast.com forward slash Gamefly, you can get a 30-day free trial Gamefly subscription on us. Now, if you're not familiar with Gamefly, it's a game and movie rental service where you can play the hottest video games for systems like the Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, or even the PS4. You can get up to two games or movies out at a time, and you can do that an unlimited amount of times a month. Josh and I love to play our game systems, and I am really enjoying the Final Fantasy VII Remake right now. And if you're like me, games are too expensive to buy and beat in the same weekend. Well, with Gamefly, you can get it and keep a game as long as you need. Then you just send it back and get the next game on your list. So head on over to fearscapepodcast.com forward slash Gamefly today and give it a try.